Today's program. Early Care and Ad Early Care and Education Advocacy Forum is uh, our opportunity this morning to remind each and every one of you how thrilled we are, most importantly, to see all of you here. I know that you took time out of your busy schedule to join us today, and the fact is you share our belief here at United Way that we must do all we can to ensure that high quality early care and education is available to all children, not only throughout our seven parish region, but across the great state of Louisiana. It is not only important for our child development, but it ensures the economic health of our great state and our region. I wanna especially acknowledge just how grateful we are at United Way to be partnered with the Kellogg Foundation. In particular, Delandra Johnson Burrell, Senior Program Officer. I want you to join me in thanking her for the financial resources that have supported today's program. Please, let's acknowledge her. Our other remarkable partner in this program today is none other than Agenda for Children, a true community treasure led by the talented and committed and relentless leader, Jen Roberts, as their CEO. I would be extremely remiss were I not to acknowledge the extraordinary leadership, talent, and commitment of our very own Mary Ambrose, United Way of Southeast Louisiana's impact officer who heads all of our community impact work. Please join me in thanking her for her commitment to the work of United Way, but more importantly, to the Alice families and the children we have a moral obligation to serve in our region. Mary. I now say that it is only fair that I give special recognition to the remarkable Pam Allison, my special projects director and partner in crime in all we do in policy and advocacy at United Way. She is a true champion and a relentless committed individual when it comes to promoting policy and advocacy. I also want to acknowledge the extraordinary work and the support that we got from Michelle Clark Payne and our entire marketing and communications team, in particular, Mary Ann Bazil, who just went beyond the call of duty. Please join me in thanking them, too. You know, as I look out into the audience, I see fellow advocates, I see parents, I see childcare providers, business leaders, I see the extraordinary staff of not-for-profits, including United Way. I see friends who've shared our passion for this work for a lifetime and make it possible for us to achieve the extraordinary accomplishments that we have been able to witness over the last 18 years of my employment with United Way. Now, for a second, let's just reflect and close our eyes for a minute on what we've had to deal with in the early care and ed education sector. I think it's fair to say Katrina comes to mind. Certainly, you can remember what Mother Nature had us face. Do you remember the silence? Do you remember coming home to our beloved community and there were no children? Today, I celebrate the remarkable commitment 
of Carol Wise, who was then serving in Women United. She made us understand that we must focus on children, and her quote became a bumper sticker for us. No children, no jobs, no recovery. She sponsored a remarkable visit and rented a bus where her friends and funding partners from across New York City came here to our region. They not only invested, they believed in our recovery. And by the grace of God, we had the resources to not only invest in early care and education providers, and we helped rebuild their centers, they are the ones that are thriving and serving our children today. Let's think about what COVID did. Can we say that there was something unimaginable that would confront us and we would have to deal with this? I do firmly believe that because of that history with Katrina, it allowed us to really understand how to set priorities early on. But you know our history. That history gave us courage. Early care and education must remain a priority. We are blessed at United Way of Southeast Louisiana to have during this critical time of recovery the partnership of none other than Dean Madeline Landrieu and the Loyola College of Law. It was through her extraordinary leadership and the skilled, articulate, capable law staff joined forces with us and made it possible for us to help all childcare centers throughout our region make sure they got every single dime they were entitled to from the federal government. It goes without saying, our child care centers do not have a sophisticated back office that can help hold their hand. But Madeline Landrieu, you did, your team did, and the recovery was remarkable. They are not only surviving, they are thriving because of you. Stand up. <laughs> We also all know the funding challenges that we face at the state, at the local, and the federal level. While we're making great progress, so much more needs to be done, my friends. That is exactly why we are here today at Clover. Clover, this remarkable campus, a reflection of what represents the best in high quality early care and education. It is now my incredible privilege and my honor to present to you our first panel. Now, we want you to understand that this is conversational. There will be no PowerPoints. There will be no formal presentation. These are champions for children. These are champions within our community that are making a profound impact. Join me in celebrating the fact that our first panel consists of Yolanda Motley, Program Officer for Early Learning Services here at Clover. She is filling in for my dear friend and CEO, Keith Lederman, who I ask that you keep him in your prayers. He was forced to fly out of town because he's had two close deaths in his family. So our prayers and our thoughts are with him, but we are delighted, Yolanda, to have you represent Clover today. I couldn't be happier than to say that we have in our midst today Patty Riddleberger, who is the Vice President for Cor Corporate Responsibility with Intergy Corporation, the incredible Bill Hammock, partner with the Lynx Restaurant Group and a leader well respected in our business community and then none other than our very own Ron McLean. He's the executive director for the Institute of Mental Hygiene but oh my gosh he's my public policy chair and he serves on the board of United Way. Join me in welcoming each one of them. Good morning, everyone. I'll say like they say in church, uh, Charmaine kind of stepped a little bit on what I'm going to say. So if you hear it again, it's okay. <laughs> so good morning. I'm, I'm Yolanda Motley. I am the program officer for Early Learning Services. I have the responsibility and pleasure of providing leadership, oversight, and direction for all of Clover's early learning services. 
for which our models are Early Head Start and Head Start. Clover provides early learning services to 1,500 children and families annually through the collaboration of its head, Early Head Start partnerships through Orleans and Jefferson Parish. Clover is pleased to host for such an auspicious event in the absence of our fearless and illustrious leader who continues to make us proud and fight the good fight for children and families, Dr. Keith Lederman, we welcome you to Clover. To our distinguished guests, uh, the representative from Congressman Troy Carter's office and to Jefferson Parish Council Member Scott Walker, your presence here underscores the significance of the issues we are about to discuss and we are honored to have you with us. Today's forum could not be more important or timely. We gather at a crucial juncture when the child care crisis is looming large, threatening the hard earned gains women have made in the workforce. It's a matter of profound importance, not only for the families directly affected, but for the well being of our communities and the future of our nation. As advocates, educators, policymakers, and concerned citizens, I am confident that together we'll find meaningful solutions to this crisis. Being a 32-year educator and administrator with direct services in early childhood education for 17 years, I'm elated to witness some of the transformational change happening in early childhood. Yet there remains the challenges of hiring and retention and fierce competition for our staff due to lower than desired wages while still trying to keep our centers and classrooms open and available for working parents or for those who may be in school. I'm encouraged to be in a room with individuals who understand the importance of early childhood education and services to children and families, to the workforce and to society as a whole, who understand what it truly means to give children and families a head start. I've always said that some of our families need a head start and a jump. I'm also pleased that early childhood education is at the forefront of conversations and that policymakers are now putting the money where it belongs. We still have a way to go, but Louisiana is making strides and is being recognized as a leader in the field with school readiness taxes and the increased amounts to child care providers through the child care assistance program. And New Orleans with the passing of the millage, which the state match affording 40 plus million dollars for additional slots to children and families. Thank you for your advocacy and dedication to putting children first to enhance their futures and hopefully support ours for all our futures lie in the hands of our youngest and most vulnerable. Just as a seedling, a seedling requires nurturing through rich soil, water, and sunlight, so do our children require nurturing through positive and consistent relationships, conducive and stimulating environments, and skilled and credentialed practitioners because what we have today, for what we do today, will have lasting impact on all of our tomorrows. I found a little quick snippet from John C. Maxwell, and it simply states, how does today impact tomorrow's success? Everyone wants to have a good day, but not many people know what a good day looks like, much less how to create one. And even fewer people understand how the way you live today impacts your tomorrow. Have you ever asked someone what he was doing and heard him respond, oh, I'm just killing time? Have you ever really thought about that statement? a person might as well say, I'm throwing away my life, because as Benjamin Franklin asserted, time is the stuff life is made of. Today is the only time we have within our grasp, yet many people let it slip through their fingers. They recognize neither today's value nor its potential. If we want to do something with our lives, then we must focus on today. That's where tomorrow's success lies. As we say in church, you're welcome, welcome, welcome. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. My name is Patty Riddlebarger. Can you all hear me? Is the mic on? Uh, closer? Better now? Okay. All right. So I'm, I'm so excited to be here today because I've, I've been engaged in this work walking alongside Charmaine and Libby and so many others for almost two decades. I was the uh, following in the big shoes of Carol Byes. I was the chairwoman of, of Success by Six in the days after Katrina. And then later, I was the, uh, uh, the president of Women United, which has been engaged in this work for so long, and then serving on the Public Policy Committee for United Way that has led the charge with all of the developments and advancements in, in early child, 
childhood care and education, which I'm going to share a little bit about with you, with you today. So it's been a privilege to be involved in this work. But I would not be here, and Entergy would not be in this space as we have been for the past 25 years, but not, but not for the leadership and vision of, of our former chairman, J. Wayne Leonard, who I, I need to give a shout out and a tribute to. Yay, yay, Wayne. Um, as a CEO, Wayne recognized the importance of early childhood and the importance of having high quality early childhood education and care. 25 years ago, he commissioned these little pieces that I handed out, I've saved some of them, and they represent some economic studies that were done that, that demonstrated the impact of every dollar that's invested in early childhood. And this particular study showed that every dollar invested in early childhood returns more than nine dollars to society. There are other studies that show even greater, even greater benefits and, and value. But the fact that our CEO saw this 25 years ago and took it on as a personal charge and then made it a corporate charge, I think is remarkable. And, and that's really why I'm here today. So I'm going to share with you just uh, brief highlights in the modern history of early care and education in Louisiana, which are from a report that Entergy uh, published last year uh, with the help of the Louisiana Policy Institute for Children and our researcher whose name is escaping me. Libby, help me. <laughs> Monica. Uh, Monica. Monica Ram uh, was the researcher who, who produced this excellent report. Um, it's available to download. I didn't have enough reports to bring with me, but I do have QR codes that I will pass out so you all can download the reports for yourself. It's an excellent piece of work. I'll, I'll pass these around afterwards. Um, but just to kind of start with some of the highlights, you know, in, in the late 20th century, scientists realized that the vast amount of brain development and ar the architecture of the brain is formed in the first three years of life. And since that time, there's been a steady push to align society's resources and focus in a way that al aligns with that basic biological science. And unfortunately, we're still working on that because I, I understand that the state of Louisiana spends less than one half of 1% of its budget on the first three years of life compared to the rest of the money that it invests in education. We, we need to do something about that. And, and I think that's part of why we're all here today. So. In the early 2000s, Louisiana only served 27% of the four-year-olds, and the state uh, ranked last in, last in the country for access to child care for three-year-olds. Um, the state's early care and education regulatory structures met only four out of 10 national benchmarks. And yet, a group of committed, dedicated Louisianians knew we could do better. One who has since left the state uh, and, and has been such an inspiration to me is Dr. Jeff Nagel. What a remarkable individual. He laid the foundation for a lot of what we see here today. Um, he introduced me to the science behind early childhood education. And then another early champion um, is Melanie Bromfin, who um, is small in stature, but she is a giant <laughs> when it comes to, to rattling cages in Baton Rouge and making noise for early childhood education. You know, these champions and others took up the cause in the late 90s and the early 2000s and have we come a long way. It's been incredible. And so this is going to be a, a little walk down memory lane. And the history really starts, you know, when things really started changing in Louisiana it was back in 2001 with the passage of LA4. And that groundbreaking program funded high quality seats for four year olds that was free for low income families. It provided for certified teachers specified child to teacher ratios. It established standards for classroom supplies and materials, professional development for teachers, and, and wraparound services for families. It really was land breaking. And then, and then in um, 2000, hold on, Go, going back. So LA4, then we had Katrina. And we've heard a little bit about what happened in Katrina. Uh, Entergy's story around early care and education in Katrina, I think, um, is similar to that of many other businesses. We found that we had employees who were scattered all over the country and, and they weren't coming back. And we said, well, you know, why aren't you coming back? The schools, the schools are up and running. And they said, schools are great, but who's going to take care of our babies? Who's going to take care of our, our little ones? In New, there was so much of the fabric of New Orleans that was just ripped apart. The, the um, home-based child cares family-based child care, all of that was gone. Every single child care business in Orleans Parish flooded. 
in Katrina. And the few centers that were able to open had waiting lists of a thousand or more children. These families with young children could not come back and that was a very stark reality for us as a business and, and, and for other businesses as well. Um, and that was a, something, a learning that we carried forward as, as uh, Charmaine mentioned, COVID and other disasters. We know the importance of getting childcare businesses back up and running as quickly as possible after disasters and that's one of the lessons that we learned from Katrina. Then in 2007, which was when I was involved in Success by Six, there was the push to pass legislation to establish the Quality Start Rating System and the School Readiness Tax Credits. And Todd Batiste, I don't know if Todd, are you in the room? Todd, Todd led that charge. Um, and so a shout out to Todd for that important work. Yay, Todd. And he's back with us. Yay. Tell, tell him I said his name. Okay. All right. And so 2008, the years that followed, the push became to expand LA4. And that was when we had the, who remembers pre-K for all? Pre-K for all, LA4, and uh, Governor Blanco signed that legislation expanding access to pre-K for all four-year-olds at risk in the state of Louisiana. It was uh, remarkable. Um, 2008, the Louisiana legislature passed the Louisiana Early Childhood Act, Childhood Act, which became known as Act 3 and it placed authority for child care under the Louisiana Department of Education. It created a statewide childhood care and education network and tasked that network with defining what is kindergarten readiness because there were no standards before that. And so with the passage of that, um, focus started shifting from four-year-olds to what are we doing for three-year-olds and younger. Um, advocates came together to write the early learning and development standards um, and, the con and establishing a continuum of milestones from birth to age four so that we could really see what, what milestones children needed to be hitting and, and where, if milestones were being missed, why? And what can we do to address the missed milestones? And so they created an accountability system for implementing high quality standards of care. So moving on in, all right, uh, 2017, under the leadership of Walt Leger, the state created this, the Early Childhood Education Fund, which matches locally raised funds for early childhood education. Yay, Charmaine. Charmaine was involved in that. And with that fund as an incentive, the same year, the New Orleans City Council approved $750,000 to establish the City Seats Program run by Agenda for Children and my good friend Jen Roberts. Um, Another, another groundbreaking development in 2017, Entergy funded the Losing Ground Report that documented the economic impact of childcare costs in the state, and, and it's huge. $1.1 billion in losses to the state and $860 million in losses to businesses in terms of turnover, absences, lost wages, lost tax revenue, et cetera. That groundbreaking research became a national model that was later adopted by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce to do a similar nationwide study. So Louisiana is mo moving to the forefront of developments for early childhood care and education. Um, continuing on, in uh, 2018, the legislature created the Early Childhood Care and Education Commission to, to develop a vision and a plan to address affordable early care. And then, and then came COVID, and we all knew what happened with that and, and the devastating impact that COVID had on childcare businesses. And um, the Louisiana Policy Institute stepped up to bring these issues to the attention of not, not only the legislature, but also the business community and um, Entergy and others stepped forward to provide grants and funding to help uh, childcare owners um, stay afloat so that when COVID, you know, when, when we came through COVID, that infrastructure would still be there um, and we wouldn't have to start from the ground up as we did after the devastation of Katrina. Um, 2021, um, advocates secured uh, a combination of sports betting revenue, Yahoo, Charmaine, um, one-time surplus funding and other recurring sources. Um, and the El Louisiana Policy Institute again stepped up after we were hit by Ida to help child care owners um, reopen their businesses and Entergy provided grants to help business owners with um, expenses associated with damages that they incurred as a result of, of Ida. Um, 
2022, um, the Louisiana Policy Institute, with funding from Entergy, launched the Economic Impact Calculator for businesses. So any business in the state can use this calculator. It's online. It's a really easy tool, and you can use it. Plug in your own information about how many employees you have and what their demographics are and how many children those employees have, and it will tell you what the cost is of gaps in child care to your specific business. It really is eye-opening, and um, if you haven't done that for your business, I encourage you to look up that calculator. It's online at the Policy Institute's website. Um, and then, um, uh, also 2022, uh, in April, a coalition of nonprofits, businesses, including Entergy, came together behind the campaign for grade level reading under the leadership of my dear friend Hamilton, who is back there, Hamilton Wave. He was. I saw him, I saw him here earlier. <laughs> Um, to pass a millage that raises $21 million annually for early care and education. And, and New Orleans was just the first because since then the list of parishes and municipalities um, that have begun allocating funds for early care and education has been growing steadily. Um, Ascension Parish, Jefferson Parish, East Baton Rouge Parish, Co Point Coupe Parish, and Shreveport have all allocated funding for early care and education. We, we are on a tide that is rolling and um, so happy to, to be a part of it. Um, so here we are in 2023, and, and what progress has been made? 90% of our at-risk four-year-olds are served compared to where we were 20 years ago. The state, which used to rank last or close to the bottom, now ranks 16th in our ability to provide and, serve and care for at-risk children. Funding in the past decade, state funding in the past decade has grown by $60 million and the number of children served continues to grow. So all of this is just to say we have momentum behind us. We just need to keep it going. And with all of you in the room, I, I know that we will. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. And thank you for Entergy's continued support and dedication for this work. Bill Hammack. <laughs> wow, she's talented. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Wow, it's great to be here. And, I, you know, I'm, I'm so excited to be back on the campus of Clover. Um, yes, yes. Can you hear me? No? That was a conspiracy, I think. No, no, let's <laughs> Testing. All right, let's try that again. Um, I think they didn't want me to talk. That's why. Yeah. Oh, that's not true. I was saying I'm so happy to be back here on this wonderful campus uh, of Clover. Um, the building that we're in right now is over 150 years old and it became part of the campus uh, 125 years ago when this agency started here. Uh, I'm very proud to have been a past president of the Clover Board. I'm also uh, very proud to be on the Clover Foundation Board now. But the work that's done on these few acres of ground here on the historic campus and next door uh, on our new campus is amazing. Not only does it impact children, our most vulnerable children, but we also impact their families and we impact uh, seniors who, who come here every day to our, our senior day uh, care facility. So if you get a chance, learn more about Clover. Also, I wanna thank uh, Charmaine and the tremendous work that's done by United Way uh, in not just this space, but in so many other critical areas of our community. Way of introduction, my name is Bill Hammack and I am the senior partner at Link Restaurant Group. Donald Link and Steven Straduski let me say senior because I'm about 25 years older than they are. <laughs> uh, I mentioned that uh, I was on the board at Clover and Clover's about 125 years old. I think it was that first board meeting 125 years ago that I was here. As I think about the people in this room, the work that you guys have accomplished is amazing. And I want to talk to you a little bit about the, hello, <laughs> a little bit about the business impact of early childhood education. Uh, I'll start by telling a story. As I was listening to Patty and some of the personal memories I have of going to Baton Rouge and walking the halls with Charmaine and Libby and Melanie and so many others of you uh, go into the governor's mansion begging for money. Uh, I thought about how long it's taken 
for this to get to where we are today. Uh, and the story it reminds me of is there is a type of bamboo in China that doesn't clump. The only way you can grow that bamboo is by using one of the nuts from a plant that is already matured. And you take that leathery hard nut and you put it in the ground. And the first year you go out once a week and you water it and you make sure that it's got sunlight. And after a year, nothing happens. You do that again a second year. You water it. You make sure it has sunlight. You nurture it. And nothing happens. You do this for four years in a row. Nothing happens. And in the fifth year, after you watered it every month, and you've nurtured it, and you've made sure it had sunlight, it shoots into a plant that grows 75 feet in one month. This is a story that reminds me of the effort that we've all put in, all of you have put in, over the last 15 years on this issue. And finally, we're seeing a point where throughout our state, uh, we are recognizing the critical need for early childhood education and care. Uh, I'm very proud of the work that I've done on the business community side of this here in, in, uh, in Orleans Parish particularly. Uh, we, um, we recognize that early childhood and education is really an economic development issue. It's a workforce development issue. It actually impacts two different workforces. It impacts the workforce today because if we provide high quality early care, our workers today can come to work. And it also impacts the work force of the future because those young folks that are in these programs are going to develop more and develop faster and be able to mature into taxpayers, into business owners, uh, and the outcomes are dramatic when we make these kinds of investments. Uh, I want to point out the, the report that Patty mentioned, Losing Ground, uh, Louisiana Child Care to Impacts. Louisiana's Workforce Productivity and State Economy. Take time to read this. Libby, your, your organization did an amazing job putting that together. It emphasizes that in the state of Louisiana, businesses lose more than $800 million annually from people who can't come to work because of child care conflicts. Uh, it also emphasizes that the state loses more than a billion seven, uh, I'm sorry, a billion two in economic activity because of childhood education. Well, if we're losing $800 million in our businesses, doesn't it make sense that we think about a way that can impact that and reverse that? And the way to do that is to put a dollar into early childhood education because we're going to get a great return on investment. That dollar is going to turn over many, many times. Um, the, uh, in my own experience, I've had the, uh, the blessing of having employed thousands and thousands of people over the course of my career. And I can tell you that I've had people come into my office and say they had to quit their jobs because they didn't have someone to take care of their children. I've also had, I remember one case in, in particular, a young lady who was making about $45,000 a year and I wanted to promote her to a different position where she was going to make about $60,000 a year. She had to turn down that promotion because she didn't have the flexibility to take care of her children that she had in the position she was now. And these are just anecdotal stories that happen over and over and over again in our workforce. Investing in early childhood education has a lot of other impacts as well. It gives us a competitive advantage because we have a better uh, educated workforce. Uh, we have a reduced cost of social services. Uh, I mentioned uh, workforce development, but this is a, it's much more than that. You know, people who, uh, kids that have gone into this program are less likely to require special education, to be retained a grade in school, to drop out before high school, uh, develop chronic diseases, and not be involved in the justice, criminal justice system. It, it just, everywhere you look at it, it makes so much sense that we need to be spending money here. 
Fortunately, uh, we were able to convince the business community in Orleans Parish. Uh, we met with, uh, well, first of all, I'll t tell you about my badge that I'm wearing. Uh, yes for NOLA Kids, that was a campaign that we put together to try and sell the millage to the voters in Orleans Parish. And uh, uh, I want to mention that uh, w we put together a political campaign committee, uh, the difference between a political campaign committee and a political action committee is a political campaign committee goes away after the campaign. And uh, I was chairman of that committee. Uh, Sharonda Williams was our treasurer. Um, uh, Tyrell Walker was our campaign manager. And Hamilton Simon Jones is here today who was the glue that made all of it come together with our campaign and all of you people who do the work. And Hamilton deserves a, a round of applause. Our, our campaign realized that we needed to not only convince those people who were impacted by not having uh, an adequate funding mechanism and a permanent funding mechanism for early child ed education, but we also needed to impact those people who didn't understand the issue. And so we began going to community meetings. We went to meetings of the Greater New Orleans, uh, GNO Inc. We went to meetings of the Business Council. Uh, we met with the Chamber of Commerce. We met multiple times with BGR as they were developing an opinion piece on the, on the millage. Uh, and we really rallied a whole number of different organizations and funding sources to raise the money that we could do our campaign, which included billboards, it included television advertising, uh, it included uh, a lot of direct mail. Uh, typical get out the vote efforts on election day and the result was an overwhelming yes for NOLA kids which is going to generate 20 million dollars a year for 20 years and with state match we're talking about 40 million dollars a year if that continues so somewhere between a half a billion and a billion dollars to be spent here in Orleans Parish because of the efforts of all of you and I want to thank you very much for that. So I'll be happy to answer any questions when we're finished about the business impact, but it's very important that we keep up doing the work. Wow. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bill. Go ahead, Ron McLean. Good morning, everybody. How's it going? All right. It's really, really good to be here with so many people who are committed to, to making a change to helping young families thrive, and to negotiate the many challenges that we face right now with policy decisions, um, policy decisions that, not, uh, that are not always in the best interest of children. But I wanted to talk a little bit about um, my experiences here at Clover. Quite frankly, I worked here some 40, 40 years ago, um, initially um, doing my first year of graduate school, social work school, um, my field placement was here at Clover, and my job was to work with um, early Head Start families than what was then the St. Thomas Project. And so beginning in, in the fall of 1983, I worked here and worked with families um, in the St. Thomas Project who were in an early Head Start program. And one day, um, unfortunately, when we were kind of working with the parents and the children out in a courtyard, there was a murder. Um, it, was, it, was, it was significantly challenging. Two guys got in an argument and one shot, shot the other and another person came and shot him again. And the children were out there and we had to move the children away. Police came and, and you know, kind of took care of everything that needed to be taken care of except for that trauma experiences that the children children had, and for me personally, um, it was a major. I guess um, it was one of those situations where I had to make the decision whether social work was for me, um, and you know it was it was tempting to walk away um, because this was dangerous. Um, I mean, physically dangerous. But what I realized at home and thinking about it the next day um, over at the offices is that those families, they can't go home. They, that was their home. That was their everyday experience. 
um, of trauma and of challenges that they face. Um, I came back um, to work at Clover some three or four years after that as a master's level social worker. And I worked in a program called the um, Family Preservation Program. It was an intense home-based program where we went into um, families' homes. Um, these families were at imminent risk for having their children removed due to child abuse and neglect. And so, um, as you might imagine, um, we experienced significant amount of adverse childhood um, issues, trauma, and you know, just the experiences that families had that were not good experiences. And you know, I always ask, what about the children? Um, and those were situations that really informed my work and also, I guess, um, increased my commitment to, to work with and on behalf of families who are vulnerable and to support children, particularly those children who um, were impacted by poverty and lived in situations where, um, where those places did matter. You know, there's data that indicates in some cases the, there's a difference in some 25 years of mortality depending, depending on where you live. And so, um, and so just applaud uh, Clover for continuing to, to, to do the work here. And for me, today, to talk about trauma and trauma-informed care, I can't help but relate that to my early experiences where we didn't have words uh, to articulate what was going on with the family, but we knew it wasn't good, and we knew that we needed to do something about it. And so, so just what is trauma-informed care anyway? So SAMHSA had a definition. In 2014, SAMHSA had a report that indicated that the defining features of a trauma-informed approach is, are, are four, major, four major features. One, a realization of the widespread prevalence and impact of trauma. Two, the recognition of the signs and symptoms of trauma. Three, um, creating a system for responding to trauma in ways that promote healing. And four, this is really important, um, it has to include um, a process for actively resisting re-traumatization. Oftentimes when agencies respond to challenges um, that families bring to them, if they don't have an understanding of the trauma experiences of children, they sometimes re-traumatize. So trauma-informed approaches is all about helping agencies recognize um, that maybe the question should be what happened to children, what happened to families, instead of what they did. Um, and therein lies the challenge for us in terms of helping agencies and individuals who find the children in ways that they don't re-traumatize. And more importantly, they're not recognizing that um, children, had had, children have had a number of adverse childhood experiences. And that's something that the term goes around a lot, ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. Anybody in here heard of ACEs? What about ACEs? Okay, ACEs. Um, it's, I want, everybody should hear about ACEs. So I'm, I'm going I'm to talk a little bit about ACEs and also um, how the state is attempting to respond and some um, recommendations for all of us in terms of supporting our children and families who've been impacted by childhood um, experiences that were not good. So childhood trauma is when an event or a series of events or a set of circumstances is physically and emotionally harmful or life-threatening and has lasting negative effects on children's functioning, on a mental, physical, social, emotional, and spiritual well-being. Adverse childhood experiences are potentially traumatic events that occur in childhood. So these ACEs are traumatic events that occur in childhood. They're common. Um, about 61% of adults in the United States report have, having at least one adverse childhood experience. Um, before, you know, even before they, they reach 18. But nearly one in six report that they had experienced four or more types of ACEs. And when we look at poor families of color, those number of ACEs that they've experienced go higher and higher. And we know what the implications are. Uh, morbidity, like really challenging um, development that might be um, impacted by substance abuse, um, childhood um, delinquency, and even things like uh, diabetes and physiological challenges over the years. So as those adverse childhood increases, 
life expectancy decreases and also um, my bit, uh, challenges like um, you know, um, health, physical and mental health challenges increase as those adverse childhood experiences um, increase, problems for families increase. Um, decades of research have demonstrated that the relationship between ACEs and several of the leading causes of death and adults, as well as the cumulative effect of additional adverse experiences. For example, a person with multiple ACEs is at higher risk for experiencing negative health outcomes um, than people who didn't have the ACEs. And we talked, somebody referenced um, James Heckman earlier, the, uh, the Chicago economics professor who indicated that the investment in childhood is a significant return, seven, nine, 12 dollars for one dollar, depending on who you, who you look at, but, but Heckman, Professor Heckman also indicated that ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, is the single biggest predictor for later problems in adult health and well-being. The single biggest predictor, these experiences that children have early on in life. And as somebody has indicated early, early on, from zero to three is a particularly challenging period because of brain development. To the extent that you have these experiences during that time, it could really, and it does negatively affect your ability to, your brain to develop. And certainly, um, when we think about children entering school with a number of ACEs that were not addressed, then we see that we have multiple problems in school and it's overwhelmed our school system. We need to do a lot more with our children from zero to three and zero to six, and we need to recognize the major impact of ACEs. And this state, um, among the number of dubious distinctions we have, um, the childhood well-being is one. We're, we've been ranked about 49th in agenda, can children, agenda for Children, and I see Teresa there. So shout out to Teresa. I'm sorry, y'all. <laughs> Teresa is the architect of the, um, of the report and has been doing it for years. And that's the Kids Counts Report is what I'm referring to, and hopefully most people are aware of that. But here we are, 49th again among out of the 50 states um, in overall child well-being. We're also the third, um, we, have the, we have the third highest number of children per capita experience two or more adverse childhood experiences. A substantial body of research indicates that experiences of childhood adversity without buffer the protective factors, and that's what we need, a lot more protective factors, that's the key here. Um, but without those protective factors, our children have significant problems with physical health, mental and behavioral health, biological health and social outcomes in adulthood. But healing is possible. I want to say this before, I, I want to end up with talking about how we can work to heal. There's extensive real world evidence of the results of integrating trauma-informed approaches that focus on preventing, recognizing, treating childhood adversity and its effects. For example, even the policy work, for example, um, the expansion of the child tax credit was associated with an immediate reduction in child abuse and maltreatment. Studies that that policy piece had a direct impact on reducing childhood um, abuse and childhood trauma. So policy advocacy does work. There are things that we can do at a systemic level that will respond to those children and families that I worked with some 40 years ago right across the way in the St. Thomas community. And so I can say a lot more, but I want to end here um, by just kind of raising awareness about what's happening at the state. There's a, there's a, in recognition of the prevalence and impact of childhood um, adversity in Louisiana, um, many individuals came together, um, individuals, communities, organizations came together, and through 2022 and 2023, created the whole Health Louisiana Plan. Um, this is a plan for, for preventing, recognizing, and treating childhood adversity. And we can talk more about that. I hope you ask me some questions, but I want to stop right here so that we can move on to the other speakers. But the facts are, it's important to recognize the context in which we do this work. And so we are experiencing, not only in this town, but especially in this town, a crisis with children experiencing trauma and adverse childhood um, situations. We have to respond to this. And we can respond to this with policy. We can respond to this with improving the capacity of the workforce, and certainly those investments by business and others that support the increasing the number of childhood seats 
for zero to three is going to make a significant difference because when you have children in situations like that, you increase the protective factors, you increase the vigilance. More and more people can recognize these experiences that children have and get them to the protective factors like the mental health professionals and others that they need to negotiate these traumas. And so I want to stop there, but there's a lot more. Thank you so much for the work that you all are doing here today. Well, I think it's fair to say that this uh, panel was um, noted as set the stage. I want to applaud each and every one of you. You've done a masterful job, and we have about two or three minutes. Um, if someone has a particular question that they would like to ask, uh, you're invited to do so now. <laughs> well, they most certainly did. Join me in thanking these extraordinary champions. Now it's my honor to request that our second panel join me on the stage. You're in for a real treat because these are the subject matter experts. Okay, panel two consists of three extraordinary collaborative partners with our United Way, who I live, work, and breathe with these individuals daily. Please join me in welcoming Libby so Dr. Libby Sonye, Executive Director of the Louisiana Policy Institute for Children, Ashley Shelton, the founder, president, and CEO of the Power Coalition for Equity, and Madeline Kirst Bateson, Director of Early Childhood Systems with the Louisiana Office of the Governor. <laughs> Dr. Sonia, you're first. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> Again, I'm Libby Sonia, Executive Director of the Louisiana Policy Institute for Children. Okay. Is that better? Okay. Yes. yes. Uh, again, my name is Libby Sonia, Executive Director of the Louisiana Policy Institute for Children, also co-chair of Go Far Louisiana, which I'll share a little bit with you. What we know in this work is that we can't do it alone. If you want to go fast at something, you go alone, but if you want to go far at something, you go together. And nowhere have we really seen that the most as in our statewide advocacy work related to early care and education with our Ready Louisiana Coalition, which many members um, of that coalition are here today. It is now 160, oh, close to 160 orgs strong of economic developers, chambers, nonprofits, child care centers, and other partners across the state squarely focused on increased investment in early care and education. That's important to know because this coalition has led the charge over the last really five years to where we went from zero state dollars going into the child care assistance program to now $87 million of state investment in early care and education. And that is no small feat. And I say this often, it's not just because the Louisiana Policy Institute throws out a report and some data. It's because we are part of a coalition that makes that data come alive with the stories that people tell and the experiences that people have from the business, business industry to our early care and education, small businesses to families and to the communities that we live in. That $87 million is quite an investment to go from zero to 87, but here's the deal. We need $115 million annually for a decade to reach the number of children at risk. So you might say then, how many children Libby are at risk? We have 173,000 children in the state of Louisiana, birth to four that are at risk. And of those 173,000 children, 159 of those children still don't have access to quality early care and education. That's a lot of babies that don't have access to quality early care and education. So that increased investment that we need annually for a decade is critically important. I'm really thrilled to be also able to share with you from a statewide view that if we don't have healthy mamas, we don't have healthy babies, and if we don't have healthy babies, we can't educate them. And my illustrious co-chair, Rochelle Wilcox, is here related to Go Far Louisiana. And that is really a strategic plan that says, Louisiana, we need to make increased investments in all things related to early childhood. 
and it has five pillars. And those five pillars are a family and provider-driven system. Because how many times do we interact with systems that people, things are done to people instead of with people? And so really with Go Far Louisiana, we want to make sure that we have families and providers at decision-making junctions all across the way from local to state. What does that look like? One way it looks like is that our Board of Elementary and Secondary Education is a governance body for K-12. It's also a governance body for early childhood. And there is no representation on our Bessie Board. It is also in, in the Department of Education, the largest number of employees in our Department of Education are early childhood employees. There is no representation on Bessie. So one of the things that we have been asking for, for from all the gubernatorial candidates is that they use at least one, hopefully two, of their governor appointees to have a provider as part of the Bessie board. Not a Libby, not a policy wonk, but a provider. The other piece of the puzzle here is that we have to empower families. Families already have power, but they don't always know how to use it. And how do we make sure that families know that they have a seat at every table, no matter where that table is? And so that family and provider-driven system is critically important. The other piece, too, is to make sure that all little ones and their mamas have a healthy start at life and that they, are, they really have access to trauma-informed care, as Ron was talking about, making sure that they actually have access to maternity care and they have access to postpartum care. Another piece of the puzzle is having a net that works. Right now, if you look at our early childhood system, it's not connected and it's not coordinated. Our families are going through like a sieve. So how do we have a system that's so connected that babies can't fall through it? and that those families understand what a system looks like for them. And it's easy to use, and you don't have to have a how-to book in 800 different ways to figure out the system. It's just incredibly complex. And part of that is when you're born, having access to a universally offered family, a home visiting program that can, you can get connected to in a hospital. And so we're really proud to be, um, be supportive of the work that's happened here with the New Orleans Health Department at Toro, Hospital and at Baptist here, where they are piloting the Family Connects program that is a universally offered home visiting program for all families. All families. Because y'all know as well as I do, no little person comes with a play-by-play -play book, and as soon as you figured it out, something squirrely happened, and families just really need support. So we're ec ecstatic about that. So that's making sure that we have um, a net that works for families. The other piece of the puzzle, which really fits into why we're talking about, talking about here today, is making sure that we have childcare for everybody everywhere in the state of Louisiana. And it's, yes, it's access, but it's also for our childcare teachers who are educators. They are not babysitters, they are brain architects. That they are, have competitive compensated wages. We don't know what, a, I don't know what a livable wage is anymore quite frankly, but we need to make sure our childcare teachers, these educators, are competitively compensated and that they have the ability to build wealth in their own way. Also, we want to make sure we have an early care and education system that is responsive to the needs of families, that harkens back to the first school area that we have about a family and provider-driven system. And that fundamentally that we know that early care and education is a small business. These small businesses are economic drivers. And so as we have been talking to gubernatorial candidates as well as other candidates, is that let's squarely put this where it is. Let's talk about economic development and these small businesses and how we grow them. Um, because we know we have 159,000 children in our state of Louisiana that are not being served. And these small businesses want to grow. They might not have the, the capital to do so. And then the fifth pillar of Go Far Louisiana is related to um, family-friendly workplaces. And we're working with wonderful partners um, and supporting them. I say they're Gladys Knight, we're the PIPs, um, related to paid family leave that United Way has worked on, Louisiana Budget Project, Power Coalition, and many others. And how do we make sure that these family, th these workplaces have family policies in place, such as paid family leave, such as having lactation rooms, such as having the ability for families to make decisions about their schedules, much like what Bill was talking about, that somebody had to turn down a job because they didn't have flexibility. What does that look like in our state? And so when we think about Go Far Louisiana, it is, there's room at the table for everybody. If, 
and it, the only way that this has been successful is because we've been in community and we worked with partners like Power Coalition and many others that have gotten into community, listened to community, because here's what we know. Community always knows what they need. And so if we think about this from a state level, we think about it this way. Again, if we want to go fast at something, we go alone. We'll probably screw it up. But if we want to go far, we want to go far together for the children of, of Louisiana. And as Tad, Tad Baptiste taught me this a couple of years ago, we want to live in a Louisiana when somebody says, how are the children doing? That we can say they're doing well. We can't do that right now, but y'all, we're making strides, and we're making strides because of the people in this room and the partners that we all work with, and that we're working together to get our, our net that works amongst our communities so that we can make sure that happens for Louisiana families. Wow. <laughs> Libby, I just got to say, um, I couldn't be more privileged, and I'm confident I'll speak for everybody in this room. The work that you were leading at the Policy Institute God bless you, and God bless your remarkable team. The work that you were doing in research, I have to tell you, would be cost prohibitive for our United Way. Our ability to really live united and to share in this work is critically important, both in our ability to advance really good public policy and serve the needs of our families, especially our Alice families, but it's so important for you to know what a value you are to this great state. So thank you for your leadership. <laughs> now, the remarkable Ashley Shelton. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> I love you, Charmaine. <laughs> Good morning, and thank you guys for having me here today. As Charmaine said, I'm Ashley Shelton with the Power Coalition. And the Power Coalition is, you know, kind of, you know, our, our real name is a civic engagement table. And so what we do for the most part is engage the community all over the state in building power and voice for historically disenfranchised communities. Um, what I'm very proud to say is what that actually looks like is early childhood education, criminal justice, juvenile justice, housing justice, economic opportunity, paid leave. <laughs> it looks like all of these different things. But one of the things that we're really proud of is the work that we've been able to do and grow in this space with Libby and Charmaine and so many others to really center early education as a strategy both to organize um, community, parents, also our early childhood education um, um, educators, and making sure that we understand like how things get connected and how we keep them connected. Um, one of the things we've also learned through, you know, right now we're running a 700,000 universe 11 touch program. So we're touching 700,000 people 11 times to help them engage in this election process. And in the process of doing that, we use that same strategy for a lot of different things. And so, um, you know, one, we knock doors for the millage, um, got the opportunity to work with Hamilton and Tyrone to educate uh, New Orleanians about what uh, this millage would do and what was on the line and who, you know, as a trusted community leader, like what and in what ways could we all work together to make this happen? Um, I was, I always tease Hamilton that every time I knock on doors in New Orleans, people ask me, well, how's the millage going? How many, <laughs> they're like, how many seats? Where are these seats? And so being able to um, work with Jen and continue to be able to tell the story of the millage and how people in our city are benefiting from this program is really, really powerful. You know, Libby talked a lot about, um, you know, she talked a lot about Go Far, and we have had the privilege of being a key partner in the Go Far process. You know, Go, Go Far for us has been eye-opening in terms of um, connecting both community and policy, um, and then also to like elected leaders that I think are, are so disconnected. I think that because we live this every day, we assume that everybody holds early childhood education in the same way. And that's just not true. It's just not true. I think that's what we've learned. And to, to Libby's point, what we did learn though is that community knows exactly what they need. We did a series of listening sessions and then followed them with ground truthing sessions and all over the state. And one of the things that came out of those sessions was that one, people were hungry to talk. They wanted to be listened to. Um, they had lots of amazing ideas. 
and that they call us on a regular basis to say what's next. And so we know that talking and being in community matters to people, and we know that that engagement and tying them back to, you know, to the legislature, tying them back to Bessie, tying them back to all of these different systems that govern our early childhood education system. And I often tease that, you know, I have the, the, the privilege of both filling rooms so that we can listen, and then filling rooms so that we can hold people accountable. And um, I remember, you know, one of the Bessie meetings, uh, one of the Bessie members um, intimated, as Libby said, that, you know, early childhood educators were babysitters. And, um, and I always tease, because my staff is like, Rochelle is running to the front. <laughs> <laughs> Because Rochelle was going to get them straight. But what I, what I do also appreciate is being able to fill those rooms, to be able to have community in the rooms, holding them accountable. Also throughout legislative session, having people in those rooms to be able to look at our legislators. And we think that this is, you know, like that's a standard procedure. No, I am really proud to say that in partnership with, you know, so many of the folks here today that our legislators are having to be more accountable than they ever had. And yes, we planted that bamboo tree, that seed a long time ago, but it is beautiful that it, it has been bearing fruit, right? And so we see for the first time, you know, this $80 million investment plus um, investment in our early childhood education system. We see these resources moving. We're in rooms with the governor trying to save and, and protect early childhood education seats. Like all of these things have been really powerful experiences um, for us at the Power Coalition. You know, one of the things that, you know, I will also kind of reflect on is that, you know, you know, Ron McLean mentioned uh, Charlie Zena and the work, well, he mentioned ACES. Um, Charlie Zena runs a program out of Tulane where he educates community leaders, judges, corporate executives all over the state about what ACES are and how it impacts their work and their lives. And, you know, I was struck as I went through the program that, I, you, you know, I like I think, and it goes back to what work is ahead of us in terms of Bessie and this new legislature that we will be voting on on, sa on Saturday. So if you didn't early vote or mail in your ballot, you have to get to the polls on Saturday <laughs> by by 6 p.m., 7 p.m., 7 p.m. No, actually, it's eight. I'm sorry, y'all. I've, I've got so many dates in my brain. It's eight. It is. I was like, early voting was six. Sorry. <laughs> But um, is that when we sat through that program, it was the epiphany of so many folks that having, you know, two or more aces between the ages of zero to three would impact your life significantly. Like this, I mean, like this emotional epiphany. And I'm just kind of sitting there like, well, aren't all the babies the same? Like, what do you mean? Like the, you know, like I, it's not an epiphany for me that if a, if, if a child has multiple bad experiences from zero to three, that they're going to have bad outcomes. Like, I, you know, like it doesn't, it's not a far leap. But I think that for, you know, we had a, um, an amazing judge and, you know, again, saying like it changed the way that she, as a juvenile judge, it changed the way that she, that she ruled from the bench. And, you know, and I think that we have to remember that we are educating people and, and helping them connect to what I think is second nature to us, but is much, much more, um, um, and in, in some cases, I mean, I think that there's, you know, after you go to a couple of Bessie meetings, it feels like there's a little bit of malicious intent, but I do feel like we have some folks that really are thoughtful and want to learn and want to be supportive to Louisiana's children, and then we need those folks to be champions and to fight for us when they're sitting on boards and commissions and legislative bodies that are not thinking about our children. And so that is not only the work of other good people on those commissions, boards, and legislative committees, but that's also all of us. And so as we work in community and engage, you know, thousands of people across this state, one of the things that we're always struck by is how much folks want to be involved and how disconnected they feel. They don't even know how to get in. They, they're trying to figure out how to get in. And one of the things that I've loved about this community is that we have created so many entry points for folks to get in. And as Libby said, there really is room um, at the table for all of us. And so as we continue this work, I just challenge you to, to get in. You know, well, most of you are already involved, but to, to get involved and to see how and in what ways, you know, we can be a part of the solution. Thank you. Yeah. Ashley, thank you so much. The work that you are doing 
in equity and justice, and I just want to applaud you on behalf of United Way because so often you've opened the door and the table for us to be able to visit with major funders. Your reputation is national as well as international, and for that we are immensely grateful. You're one of my heroes. <laughs> Madeline, please. Hi, good morning everybody. I'm Madeline Karspatson, Director of Early Childhood Systems in the Office of the Governor, and it is such a pleasure to see so many friendly faces this morning. It really is just a reminder of how connected this community is and how loving everyone is. Um, and so when you walk into a room full of people, you don't always see people smiling and hugging each other. Um, and so to, to walk into this space, of course, a space that is rooted in love because of the work of United Way. Um, it's just really such a pleasure to be here. And to speak on behalf of Governor Edwards is also a huge honor and pleasure. It is not a lie when I say that either. He really has, um, in his tenure as governor, a, been thoughtful about the early childhood community. And while the I would say probably the majority of the changes that we were able to see came towards the end of his tenure as governor. He, for a long time, has been mindful about it. Of course, First Lady Donna Edwards was an educator herself, a music teacher, um, and someone who was uh, intentional about literacy rates and things like that in our state. Um, but, you know, while Governor Edwards was in service, we saw the creation of that matching fund, right? And then we saw the creation of dedicated funds to that fund. And while it was a complete joy for him to um, endorse those activities, it really was the work of everyone that's sitting in front of me, right? It, it's the work of the coalition of many different types of people, not just early childhood providers, but um, sheriffs, right? Uh, people in the, in the religious community, uh, the commission at the Department of Education um, pulling together so many different people across different aisles um, and different industries that all have a reason to be invested in early child education. So um, while I will say several things that happened in the, governor, in the Edwards administration, I also know that just me being in the office or just the governor um, leading the state is not the only thing that created those things to happen and it's mostly all of you. So this is really just a big old thank you <laughs> to everybody in the room. But during the governor's administration, of course, we also saw two very historic investments in early care and education. In the 2022 legislature, we saw investments into that matching fund to the tune of $40 million, which had never happened before. And we also saw investment in CCAP, the Child Care Assistance Program. This year, we had a also sizable historic investment into CCAP. Um, we were unable to secure an investment in that matching fund this year, but um, we know that that's something that we have to focus on in the future is that matching fund and then continuing investments in CCAP. I think a big discussion in legislature um, this past year, realizing that a lot of the COVID stimulus dollars that really helped us keep our children safe is now been expended, which is what the state was charged to do. So I am proud that the Department of Education really, and then with the help of the Louisiana Policy Institute, Policy Institute for Children with Libby Sonye, um, they were really hitting the ground running, getting those dollars out to providers to stabilize the industry and to support families. And that's what they were charged to do and they did it. But that means we spent a lot of money that we don't have anymore. And that means that even with the historic investments from Governor Edwards and legislature by support of advocates, we have a long ways to go, right? Dr. Sonia said, we have $115 million that we have to invest every year for 10 years to really get to where we need to be. And it's important to keep that in mind. And then also coming to legislature, you know, in this coming spring with realistic and feasible asks, not diminishing the 115 million asks, we cannot do that. They have to know the reality. But then saying, if we can't do 115, what can we do that is reasonable, even with this ominous, scary funding cliff that, that, we're, that we're literally looking at with early, early care and education, but then also legislature too, you know, has, has a lot of responsibility with our budget. So, um, Governor Edwards has been a leader in early care and education. It has taken the work of a lot of advocates. Unfortunately, it took the work of a worldwide pandemic for people to also begin to understand the importance of early care and education so that when the governor 
submits a budget request that the legislature actually listens, right? But as um, Ashley said, not every legislator, while they may say, yeah, babies, we love the babies, we love kids, <laughs> right? They don't necessarily understand what that means. And no legislature would ever question not funding K-12. That is just something that we do. Why aren't we doing that for B to three or B to four? What, like, what is that? <laughs> and that's still something that I think a lot of the advocates in here are still working on, is like, what is that missing link? If it's not trauma-informed care and preventing ACEs, that sells it. If it's not the business case that sells it, if it's not just for doing right by our children and families that sells it, then what is that? And I know that everyone in this room is, is thinking about that and, and working on that, and the governor has as well. During the session, he was like, okay, Maddie, I need you to bring in an early childhood person, whoever you think is the most influential in the legislature, who's an advocate, and we need to get them in the room because something's going sideways with, with, with the budget, and we need to make sure early care and education is funded. And I was like, sir, we're not going to be able to meet in your office because you only have one extra chair in here. <laughs> so I was like, we're going to need to go to a different room with like 20 chairs. Is that okay with you? Um, and he was like, go for it, girl. Um, he didn't actually say that, but um, <laughs> um, we were able to, to convene a ton of different people because a ton of different people are invested in this process. And if you're one of our friends in here who's, who's been leading the charge for decades, long before I got in the governor's office two years ago, then you understand this. And if you happen to be in the room and you're just getting into early care and education advocacy, please don't leave before talking to one of the panelists today. Maybe you're in the business industry community. Maybe you're an educator yourself um, in the K-12 system. Maybe you're a community leader. Maybe you are hoping to run for an elected position in the future and you want to understand this. Please do not leave without asking for a follow-up from someone because that's what's going to be the difference. It took someone really helping Governor Edwards before I got there, because I, before me there was no position like this. It took someone educating him to help him really understand all the many cases for care, early care and education for him to say, yes, let's do this, and let's make sure we do it in a smart way that's financially feasible uh, and sustainable. So, you know, no one wakes up, unfortunately, understanding the, the, the case for early care and education. It does take educating, even though many of us in the room are like, you have to educate someone on the importance of early care and education? Like, what? Because um, it is important. My last point I'll say, too, is that it's not just investing in CCAP and the matching fund that the governor has been working to do to help better families and young children. He also has been a longtime supporter of a higher minimum wage. He also, yes, and he also was influential um, in supporting the fact that some um, uh, state workers now have six weeks of paid family leave, right? And he knows that it's going to take a myriad of, of resources um, for children to really get the strong start that, that they deserve. And another initiative of his this past year was the Dolly Parton's Imagination Library program, where <laughs> that, that is a program that mails one free book a month for children ages birth to five. And it's free of cost to families. And because of Dolly Parton's investment in the program, the community cost or the state cost is $2.20 a book. And with the governor's legislation that was um, authored by Rep Representative Melinda White, it, it sets up a, a formula, or a formula, but a foundation that says the state will invest half of that. So now communities are only having to cover a dollar ten a book, um, and to just make sure that children have access to age appropriately, developmentally appropriate books. And um, we hope that. Of course, families don't think of this as a replacement for early care and education because it's absolutely not, but then we, we hope in the same turn that early care and education providers um, see that as 
an added supplement to your work at home and so that all children can have access to books and they can sign up any time between birth and five. So um, Governor Edwards sincerely understands uh, the issues of early care and education. It's been a complete pleasure to work with him and to work with you over the last two years and him for the last eight years. And um, we are wanting to be very intentional for whoever our next leader is in office that we set them up for success. And so know that that is something that we are going to be really intentional on in the next few months. I think it's fair to say, and I will say this from the bottom of my heart, when you elect a governor who gets it, it is not only inspirational, the impossible becomes possible. And I just want you to know that Maddie has been on speed dial for all of us. And I cannot thank you enough for showing up at every event that we have held, if it was Early Ed Week, Early Ed Month, if it was our special significant Early Ed Day at the Capitol, which we do annually. Not only were you present, but our governor participated because he gets it, as does the First Lady. And I could not give enough accolades for United Way of Southeast Louisiana. I'm reminding all of you, he has been a legislative champion for us with the Ready Louisiana Coalition and United Way for every single year he's been in office. So kudos to Governor Edwards. If there are any questions of this panel, uh, Norma? Is there, is there a scorecard of any sort from the panels on who is supporting what and how any of those of us who are still voting on Saturday or have not done early voting, where can we find that information that is basically reported by you all on the best outcomes that we can expect going forward. Because Edwards has been so important that how do we make sure we have somebody at all levels and offices doing that? So I'll start and then I'm going to push it to Ashley. Uh, so on, in Sunday's paper in the Advocate, they did a side-by-side -side comparison of all the gubernatorial candidates education was one of the pieces. There was one, one, only one candidate in the advocates analysis that squarely put in early care and education, and that was, is um, Dr. Sean Wilson. What we have seen in the gubernatorial forums that the majority of the governor, gubernatorial um, candidates have been at is they have, they have said early care and education is important. Uh, the LPB debate that was a couple of weeks ago, I heard words from four out of the five candidates that were there, such as fully funded, special session related to not just crime, but crime and early care and education. Mm -hmm. um, we've heard proposals from, um, from candidates related to potential funding of things. We've heard words like, um, instead of just regular tops, but having tops for tots. So we've heard some different things this election cycle amongst our gubernatorial candidates than, than we've ever heard before. And in our own meetings with the, all the gubernatorial candidates, we have heard you know, that they would take it under strong encouragement and advisement to have at least one Bessie member um, represent early care and education on Bessie. So is there a clear winner in them? No. Um, but they've all said something, but we all know, and we scream about this all day long. <laughs> your words are good, but what are your actions? And we want to see the actions follow those words. Yes, and then um, the other thing that, um, that I would share, I know we did a, a series of forums all over the state, and so all of those can be found on our website at powercoalition.org. And um, in addition to that, we are currently cooking up some good trouble with uh, the Louisiana Partnership for Children and Families, and Libby as well, um, to put together a scorecard um, as we kind of look, yeah, like, so it's, so it's coming, it's coming. And so I don't know, you know, I think that it's going to be in the runoff scenario, it's not going to necessarily necessarily um, get to you for Saturday, but, um, but we are making sure that we put that scorecard together because I think that what's hard is that Bessie has become so political 
that um, we've got to get beyond people's politics and remember that we're, <laughs> we're supposed to be centering our children. And so I think that we will see several, you know, several runoffs in, in that particular um, category as well as uh, several you know, legislative seats. And so as, you know, at all levels of government. So yeah, so there'll be more to follow. And yeah. I would say this too, what we heard at early a day at the Capitol this past year by actually Representative Delisha Boyd from this area, she said, pay attention to the people who don't pay attention to the children. Amen. And that has sat with many of us that were in that room. And so as the, the scorecard was being thought about, when, when it goes live, you will be able to see the people that don't pay attention to the children in the state of Louisiana. Please join me in thanking our panelists. And now I invite our third panelist to come up. Please join me in acknowledging that today we have in our presence the Honorable Council Member at Large Scott Walker. He is, he's with us at this time while he's campaigning feverishly. Scott, I just want to say that your presence here this morning is a true indication of the commitment that you have made not only to the children that you were serving in Jefferson Parish, but your priorities are obviously very straight, and for that we are immensely grateful. I'd like to also acknowledge that we have with us Sarintha Strickland, who's the executive director of the Jefferson Ready Start Network. We also have Paula Polito. She's also with the Jefferson Ready Start Network and owner of Berry Cherry Tree Child Care, which has been uh, in her family for many years. And of course, we have um, speaking this morning on this panel, Jen Roberts, who's the CEO with Agenda for Children. Please welcome our panelists, and Scott, you go first. Thank you, Charmaine, and thank you all for being here today. This is actually a very nice break from our silly campaigning that's been going on for so long. Uh, this is much more important than campaigning, I think. Obviously, we need to win an election to keep this going. Um, but this started, uh, my interest in this started four years ago when I was running for office for the first time, and Paula and Sarintha and Charmaine were in my ear quite often. Persistent, persistent, persistent. Um, kindly persistent, I like to say. Uh, not overbearing in any way, but um, just wanted to put this on my radar. And to be honest, I didn't think much about it. My mom was a school teacher for 40 years at St. Pius, St. Angela, Mount Carmel, so education was always important to me, but I didn't know to the extent that Jefferson Parish was dealing with uh, economically disadvantaged students and how far and wide this problem reached. So, and it was a lot to wrap your head around. I mean, when you just get thrown this stuff and you've never really talked about it before, and you've got three people coming at you from all directions, maybe four sometimes, um, and telling you what this situation is, and you're trying to understand it all, it's a lot. But over time, we've, we've uh, drilled down on it and been able to understand it to a, to a level that we can convey that message to other people, too. And I feel like I'm just a, a mouthpiece for this because I have a platform and can spread this message to a wider audience than may, we may be able to otherwise. Um, but it's critically important what we're doing in Jefferson Parish. We've only scratched the surface, and we were delayed in that because those meetings during the campaign four years ago, uh, COVID came three months after we took office, and that slowed everything down. So we really didn't get rolling on the initiatives that we plan to get rolling on sooner until, I guess it was mid-2021. Is that right, mid-2021? I think somewhere in that time frame where we finally were able to dedicate some funding for this. And in politics, there's a lot of disagreement about a lot of things, obviously. And on the Jefferson Parish Council, I'm one of seven. As a councilman at large, I represent the entire parish. We have the five district council members and two at-large members. So you, you need four votes to get anything done. And sometimes that's a challenge. In this particular case, when I approached all of my colleagues about funding from their offices for early childhood education, it was not a challenge. 
They all responded, and they all contributed money from their offices, and they've done so for the past three years now. And that's been something that, um, especially in an election year, was, was good to see because, in fact, some contributed more than they ever had because it was an election year. Um, <laughs> but it, it shows the importance in, in our parish, and what Orleans Parish has done is great, and we're, we're a little bit behind from that standpoint because we've contributed, with the state's matching fund, about $2 million over the past three years which is a nice start, but we're certainly not where we want to be yet. And it's something that we think about every day. It's something that I think about every day, how we can generate a permanent funding source um, from ways other than a millage right now. In Jefferson Parish, it's difficult to raise taxes, sometimes more difficult than it is in Orleans Parish. Um, but it's something we could look at down the road. It's something we haven't looked at yet. But I will, early next year, assuming all goes well in this election, which I think it will, early next year uh, convene a roundtable of key stakeholders in Jefferson Parish to talk about this workforce issue. As you've heard mentioned today, it's a workforce issue of today and it's a workforce issue of tomorrow. So it's to all of our major stakeholders in Jefferson Parish advantage to come together and figure out a way to put money each year towards early childhood education because you are building your future workforce. There aren't many politicians, I don't think, who are willing to take up a cause that has a payoff that's a generation away. But that's what this is. And we've kicked the can down the road in Louisiana for far too long. We can't do it anymore. And it has to start today. And for us, it started a couple of years ago. Nobody on the Jefferson Parish Council was talking about early childhood education before I started the conversation in 2021. Um, we have the Head Start, an early Head Start program in Jefferson Parish, which is federally funded. Um, but the parish funds it to a shortfall of about a million and a half dollars a year. And that's something that needs to be addressed as well because that money could be, I think, better used if we're not funding a shortfall. The grants fall short of what we need them to and um, they're very different. Head Start, Early Head Start, Jefferson Ready Start Network and council funding, like it goes to the Jefferson Ready Start Network from us, cannot go to Head Start and Early Head Start in the same way because we can't give money to another government organization like that. But we have found a way to help. Um, you know, I funded, my office funded renovations to a Head Start facility in River Ridge, full renovations. The plans were sitting there, it was damaged during Hurricane Ida, they were ready to redo it and get things back on track, but they didn't have the money. So we funded that so we could get 68 children back into uh, that center. And that's how we help on that end. Because look, we took a little bit of heat, my office did from from some people in the parish, they're like, well, you're doing all this work with the Jefferson Ready Start Network, what about Head Start? And so we haven't forgotten Head Start, we just can't fund it in the same way, and we need to find a way that we can help. So through various meetings, we found ways that we could help, and we could contribute, contribute to their success. It's just done in a different way uh, than we can with the Jefferson Ready Start Network. I think um, we're certainly doing good things, and we're doing the right things, but we need to do a lot more things. We need to increase awareness within our community. We need to increase awareness with other political leaders and we need to increase awareness um, really across the board for anybody who is invested in the future of Jefferson Parish because we really can't talk about the future of Jefferson Parish ever. And we've been you know, on campaign stops for months now talking about the future of Jefferson Parish. And everybody wants to talk about this, that and the other, but you can't really talk about the future unless you invest in the real future in Jefferson Parish. And that's where we are. There is no future worth talking about if you're not raising up the future leaders of our parish today. We talk about resident retention. We're having a hard time keeping people in our parish. We're having a hard time keeping people in our parish because the educational system has stunk for a long time. And our, some of our youngest learners have gotten off on the wrong foot early and they never catch up. And when they don't catch up, they end up in the crosshairs of JPSO or the NOPD. And that's something you can't recover from. So we need to get, regardless of economic background, our youngest learner's educational background should not be affected. And that's the message we have to try to communicate, that it starts and ends with early childhood education. There is nothing beyond that without that. So that is where the most important aspect of this all lies, is with early childhood education, with our youngest learners, making sure that they are they're starting at the same level as their peers with greater economic means. Because we're not going to be able to attract the employers we want to attract, 
We're not going to be able to keep the residents we want to keep. We're not going to have the opportunities in our parish that we want to have unless our youngest learners are equipped to navigate life and become contributing members of society down the road. So what are we doing today that benefits the children now who are going to be graduating from college in the 2040s, the early 2040s? What are we doing today for them? I look at what we do as we're in office, I'm in office for a finite period of time. We're in this leadership position for four to eight years. Hopefully it's eight. If it's four, then I don't know who's picking up the torch for me after I'm gone. But hopefully I have four more years to work on this and we have an opportunity to do some good things. We have that finite period of time to make a difference, to leave it better than we found it, and to do good things in our parish. And I believe that I have to do this now so the groundwork is laid and we have to find a permanent funding source now so the groundwork is laid for four years from now and somebody can continue this and we continue to make Jefferson Parish the best place that, that we can make it so it's an attractive place for our, our young adults, our adults, our seniors, and everyone else. And there are a lot, you know, I don't have to sugarcoat the problems that Orleans Parish has had in recent years. And Jefferson Parish has not had those same problems. And there are people who like to criticize Orleans Parish for the gain of Jefferson's Par Jefferson Parish. I don't like to do that because, number one, I'm not like that, but number two, I think we are all stronger when Orleans Parish is stronger and Jefferson Parish is stronger. <laughs> Together, I mean, Jefferson Parish, nobody's coming to our state to see some of the great tourist attractions. Some are. I don't want to say nobody. Um, we, we realize that most people travel to this region for the French Quarter and they travel to New Orleans for the sights and sounds of what you find there. So when New Orleans is firing on all cylinders, then we can fire on all cylinders. We become the benefit of hotel room stays and people taking advantage of some of our uh, amenities that we have to offer. Because they've come for some other reason, they might stumble upon some of ours or they come for hours and they go to Orleans. It, it doesn't matter how they get here or why they're here, it matters that they're here. So it's important that Orleans does well, Jefferson does well, and we do well together because I don't think that educational deficiencies or progress see the parish line and the 17th Street Canal. Amen. So when we are all functioning as one and we can all do things together and make sure that um, everything is, is working the way it should be, then we're in a much better place educationally. And I commend New Orleans for what it's done. I mean, it was a bold, bold initiative to pass that millage to generate $20 million a year for early childhood education. <laughs> My first thought was, when the dollar for dollar state match is taken into account, do they take up all the money? Are they using all the money? Is there any money left for anybody else? Um, but I think we all, we all can work together. We're gonna be firing, uh, firing up our own initiative soon and we'll be right on the heels of what Orleans Parish is doing yearly to generate more seats for early childhood education to make sure that our youngest, our youngest learners are doing what they need to do to be successful later in life. Thank you. Scott, uh, before we move on, I would be remiss in not acknowledging the extraordinary leadership that you have demonstrated working in partnership with United Way of Southeast Louisiana because Jefferson Parish um, took a pretty big hit from a hurricane. And um, you uh, actually stood up and we shared some of the most exciting pop-ups that were hosted by our United Way, serving the citizens throughout your region. And I have to tell you, to see you out there with us, working shoulder to shoulder, meant the world to the people that we were serving. But we appreciate your leadership and your confidence in the fact that United Way has a, play, a, a role to play in emergency response and recovery. So thank you so much for what you're doing on that front as well. And thank you. And again, after um, also the tornado on the West Bank, when. Yeah the United Way was, was there to, to offer a hand immediately. Um, let me backtrack real quick and just say one more thing before I wrap up. I mentioned my council colleagues, and they're very important in this because they've all contributed money from their offices. And we have a breakdown from the Jefferson Ray Start Network for the number of seats that are provided in each district across um, Jefferson Parish. So we, we were able to show the results to District 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. This is what your money went to. This is how many seats were created in your district. And this is the direct immediate impact we're having on children in Jefferson Parish. And each council office roughly 
contributed $25,000 per year for the past few years. Some contributed a little bit less. This year, everybody contributed $25,000, like I mentioned. And over the past three years, we've contributed um, about $1.7 million from the adding up to the state's taking into account the state's matching fund, the council donations, and donations from private organizations, the Jefferson Community Foundation, and the Jefferson Business Council. So the more of that private money we can get involved as well, the more it adds on to that total and makes it all the better in the end. Thank you. So true. Now, Saretha. Is it on? Thank you. Good morning. As Charmaine said, I'm Sorrentha Strickland. I'm the executive director for the Jefferson Ready Start Network. It really is exciting to be here, and I'm telling you, I'm just always so excited when I get to sit next to this gentleman and think about what has happened over the last couple of years and to recognize that he has been here all morning that he has been supporting our efforts, leading the charge, being the face of early care and education over the last several years, because we knocked on his door a couple of times, <laughs> and he said, yes, this is critical, this is important. Mm -hmm. And a lot of you in the audience are like me. You're an early childhood educator. If you had told me 10 years ago, we'd be spearheading an effort to bring together the business community leaders in our community in terms of parish leaders, um, superintendents, those kinds of folks, I'd have, I probably would have just laughed because our real efforts have been about supporting providers to increase quality of the interactions that their teachers have with children within classrooms. And that's a real noble effort, and it's an effort that continues today, right? I, I look across the room and think of the folks that I've worked with over the years across Orleans and Jefferson parishes, and, and those were our goals, right? We want to do better by children. But very quickly, we began to realize, and I, and I have to tell Scott, I'm just a little bit disappointed that he didn't quote our numbers. Because he, is, he has been amazing at talking about the number, so <laughs> the number of children in Jefferson Parish. Because when, when we saw a difference um, in our state to move towards more local networks, to really focus not just on quality, but to begin thinking about access and increasing access for young children. You know, one of the first things we had to do in Jefferson was say, well, how many children are there? And so there are about 28,000 children birth through four years of age. And when we look at those who are economically disadvantaged, you know, we're really about 20,000 children, depending, of course, on which definition you use for economically disadvantaged. We're only serving about 5,000 children on a good day in publicly funded seats in Jefferson Parish. And I really think when we begin to talk about this panel and the charge from United Way to think about local advocacy, that gap really sticks with you. And I think it was that, that gap in the number of children not being served in Jefferson Parish that really resonated with Scott and the other um, council members on the Jefferson Parish Council. It really began the conversation and the development of our Ready Start Network. Most of you know Ready Start Networks pretty much exist throughout the state now. But there are relatively recent um, construction of organizations or gatherings of people in parishes to really look at the gap, really begin to look at access issues, begin that effort of local advocacy. So the Jefferson Ready Start Network is a coalition of thought partners that brings together providers, brings together advocates, business owner, owners, parish leaders, community organizations to really begin thinking about how we advocate, how we come together, how we work together to really address that gap in services. 
We've been working on quality specifically as the lead agency in Jefferson for over 10 years. And we've had a vision to increase quality, and we've been pretty successful in pulling together different grant funds. But if you work through grants, you recognize grants are in cycles. One year, three years, you know, you're a year and a half in and you're looking for the next grant to fund the work that you're trying to do to support providers around quality. We've also done some similar things. How do we piece together at the local level funding in order to increase access? As Scott mentioned, we've had some pretty incredible partnerships with the council, with the Jefferson Business Council. I'd be remiss if I didn't call out our partner um, and the Jefferson Community Foundation. Christine Brady is the executive director. We've begun to think differently. We are not a coalition of providers anymore, right? We're a broader coalition that's in the community and not simply a lead agency under a school district, but really thinking differently about how we work with nonprofit partners, how we think differently, how we think out of the box to really push our local advocacy efforts forward. Right now, we're very excited. Um, those efforts include in what we'll call an educational campaign, right? So we, we are not out advocating for a millage at this moment. And in fact, in Jefferson, we have to be very careful of the terminology we use, right? The voters in Jefferson look a little different than voters in some other parishes. We have to be very, very thoughtful. We need the Bill Hammocks of Jefferson Parish to join us, right? Absolutely. We have to look differently at our coalition. We have to be guided by providers. We have to be guided by families. But we need to bring these folks together to continue our first step of education. We put some materials on the table, one to show you some of the work we've done with grants to begin increasing quality and to think about those children who have the least access in Jefferson. And our data really show landscape analysis of families, of um, who is being served by providers, really show gaps in serving our Latino population. Latino children and families in Jefferson Parish have Although they're a growing population, they've had the least access to services. So we know that's a piece we have to work on. We're grateful to a grant from Entergy that has helped us develop a two-generational workforce project. So again, that notion of the workforce of today and the workforce of tomorrow, we've been able to offer apprenticeships for um, Latino women to um, support them with wraparound services to get into the workplace, offer their child a high quality seat in an early care and education setting at the same time. So we continue to work on those pieces, but you'll also see on your table our effort to educate. So we have um, an ad that's been developed with some of our Jefferson Parish leaders, including um, Scott. We have brought folks together to begin getting a message out there. First, who is the Jefferson Ready Start Network? But most importantly, the why. And we all know the why that we all come together in terms of those critical periods or to address those children that have um, experienced um, um, different adverse early childhood experiences, um, as we've already heard about as well. So first, it's education. And you see a mailer on the table that we put out after we polled voters in Jefferson to figure out what messages resonate with them. We know we really have to think about what they care about and help them understand how early childhood, high quality early childhood education can really address some of those issues in our community. And so I'll end with, we're very excited about where we are. We are excited about our partnerships with United Way, Louisiana Policy Institute, other incredible organizations. We want to continue those, and we really want to continue the fight in Jefferson and learn from what you guys have done in Orleans and, and continue that because we need to move from piecemealing things together to having a real long-term um, strategic investment 
a strategic plan for strategic growth to have incredible services for children and families in Jefferson for many, many years to come. Thank you, Sorrenta, and thank you so much for your passion and your leadership. You have pulled together the most robust, diverse, group of individuals serving on the Ready Start Network, and I couldn't be more honored to be participating in that as your chair. So God bless you for all you bring to the table to serve the children of Jefferson Parish. We are immensely grateful. Next, Paula Polito. Thank you, Charmaine. Um, and if I might just for a moment um, ask for a point of personal privilege and ask everyone to just bow their heads for a moment and be mindful of the senseless tragedies that are occurring in Israel right now. Um, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Um, as most of you all know, um, I came into this work um, well, I was born into it, so my grandmother started a cherry tree in 1974. My mother then worked alongside of her, um, opened Berry Cherry Tree, and in 1999, she said, well, would you like to buy this center from me? And I said, no, I don't want to do this. I saw the headaches. I saw the late night calls. I was at the center on the weekend, going to Sam's, purchasing the milk. Um, I wanted to do something bigger, I always thought. In 99, I wound up purchasing the center from her, and unmarried, no children, walked into a center that served 180 children and said, what do I do with this? I wanted to make it the best. I wanted it to be the best center for every child that entered those doors, and that's where um, the journey to quality began. And I looked for um, those shining lights, that North Star, what did it look like? Um, so we started with the NACI accreditation, and all you educators in the room are familiar with NACI, the National Association for the Education of Young Children. Then Louisiana implemented a Quality Start program and worked towards that. Um, along that sort of trajectory, I ran into some pretty spectacular people. Um, right down there, the other blonde, um, Melanie Bronfen, who's not here. And Charmaine asked me to speak to community involvement, and that's where it began. Melanie Bronfen coming to my child care center to say, wow. This is incredible. You have a kangaroo right there. This is great. These kids are learning. Um, come knock on doors. Come to Baton Rouge. Come do all these things. And I was honestly humbled at the fact that Melanie asked me, just little me who ran a child care center, to go to Baton Rouge. And before you know it, my advocacy around early care and education began. And almost that journey to do something bigger began and it fuels the fire in everything I do today because it energizes me to get up and speak to a group of people like you guys. Pearly, I'm looking at you, Rochelle, Christy, you're doing it every day. You're the leaders that I interviewed a few months ago. You know what it takes to get in there and do it every day. We don't need to talk to you guys. You know the importance of it. It's the others um, who don't quite understand what that looks like. Um, and so I also, beyond running a child care center, I serve as the chair for Louisiana Department of Education's Early Childhood Advisory Board on the Birth to Three Commission and a host of other um, different boards, which, again, I am humbled to be a part of. Right before COVID, I had a neighbor, his name was Scott Walker, and um, he uh, soon became Councilman Walker. And I told Sorrentha, I said, we should go have coffee with him. We should talk about this Jefferson Ready Start Network. And it was as simple as that. And Scott's words to me that day were, I want to champion this work. And he said just a few minutes ago, well, I'm a mouthpiece. He's more than that because he not only has said it, he's done it. He's put the money behind what he said he was going to do. And so when I'm out here advocating for him for a second term, I get to say, this guy's doing what he said he was going to do. I don't know anything about politics. And that's part of why Scott has done so well. He didn't come into this work as a politician. Sorry, this is like Scott Walker's speech. But um, I think it's grounded in the fact that it's about relationships. And 
being a neighbor and going to have coffee turned into here we are with this huge investment for Jefferson Parish and the children. And so I would encourage everyone to continue to build those relationships. Um, our relationship with the Jefferson Community Foundation, our relationship with the Jefferson Chamber of Commerce, Ruth Lawson, and prior to Ruth was Todd Murphy, who said, we're gonna, we're gonna advocate this, advocate for this in Baton Rouge. I don't pay them to do that. I go and volunteer, but they sure enough did that. They went to Baton Rouge and continue um, to advocate for early care and education. So I think it is grounded in the relationships you build. Um, there is no right way to do it. And I often tell Dr. Strickland, it takes a certain skill set to do this Ready Start Network, right? She comes from um, you know a discipline of early care and education and that expertise. Um, I have an MBA and I own a child care center and you just craft that language differently. I think it's important to know your audience um, and what makes sense to them. Sorintha alluded to our flyer. We often talk to businesses in Jefferson Parish and we know what's important to them is to operate a productive business. Well in order to do that you need employees and so we use that language when we speak to them. Um, we've had Sheriff Joe Lapinto advocating for our work in Jefferson Parish. So again, I think it's just many conversations with different people. Um, while they may not want to listen at first, persistence pays off and you know, we might have to make a few phone calls, but we will do just that. So um, I just would like to say, I think it ends and begins with relationships. So mm -hmm. thank you. Well, thank you so much. Paula, you're amazing, and I know United Way couldn't be more proud of the work that we are doing in that. We have partnered with you on at your very own center, but I thank you especially for continuing to open your doors to educate our elected leaders and our community, because I really truly believe without taking them into a high quality child care center, so many of our citizens would not realize just how important quality is and what quality looks like. You have done an amazing job and I thank you very much for that. It's now my privilege to present the remarkable Jen Roberts. Mm -hmm. My gosh, where on earth would all of us be were it not for Agenda for Children? I have to tell you, they are amazing. They are a phenomenal resource. And Jen, you're an inspiration to all of us. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, while I am here representing Agenda and I'm here to talk a little bit about this local advocacy work that we did, um, there is an entire table of women back there that could have easily have also served in this role. And we're going to talk a little bit about the work that they did. Um, as many of you know, I'm Jen Roberts. I serve as the CEO of Agenda for Children. Um, prior to being in this role, I've been a practitioner, I've run a foundation, I've been an administrator, and um, I've been with Agenda for now about five years. And I think it's the diversity of those roles that really helps me take a step back and think about these issues from kind of a 10,000 foot level. Agenda will celebrate our 40th anniversary next year. 40 years. Um, we are proudly women-led. We were started by the powerhouse Judy Watts, <laughs> who I will always invoke. Um, we continue to do policy and advocacy work alongside many, many people in the room, but the last 10 years of our work has really been situated by what's been happening at the state in early care and education and anchored in our kids count work, which um, thank you, Ron, for the shout out for Teresa <laughs> back there. Um, we do in fact have our kids count report, so we'll make sure that we get them on your table um, if you're interested. Some of the most concrete examples of some of the work that we've done and why our advocacy was so successful is because we are part of the ecosystem here in early care and education. For example, we trained 7,000 uh, early care and education teachers last year. We distributed over $7 million in early care and education grants last year to our providers across all 11 parishes. Um, 
we also serve as the Ready Start um, and the New Orleans Early, Early Education Network and lead agency here in Orleans Parish. So the work that Paula and Sorrentha lead in Jefferson is the work that um, agenda and led by a steering committee that has been 90% providers since day one. We lead our kids count work. And so when it came time to really go into the work around advocacy, we are coming with 40 years of history of working alongside people in field and also families and knowing really what, um, you know, not knowing, um, we've just been in community for a really long time. <laughs> and we take that really seriously. So before the millage, we knew there were 8,300 children in this community that were eligible for programs but could not take advantage of them. And so in the same way you guys talk in Jefferson Parish about your number, that is the number we hit the ground with, 8,300. And if you take Bill Hammock's uh, analogy and metaphor of the bamboo shoot, our bamboo shoot has grown in one year. We will now serve 2,200 children in one year more than last year. Our organization uh, is largely responsible for coordinating all of that. Um, we manage, about, we coordinate about $100 million in public investment for the State Department, for the you know, State Department of Education, but we directly administer over $50 million of local and state money related to seats. What that means is that there is a high level of accountability, integrity, communication, transparency, and partnership. I could say all of those things over and over and over and over again because we take our role very, very seriously. But I also want to say that this is not just about increasing seats. This is about ensuring that we can create seats all day. If we don't have kids sitting in seats, if we don't have seats that make sense for families, if they are not operating at the times of day that families need, if they are not good quality, then that is not true access. And that does not serve the needs of families. And so step one is ensuring that we have the seats. And we have to make sure that they really and truly meet the needs of the families. And the best way to do that is to partner with our providers who are working closest to the families every single day. I also wanna say that today's um, kind of headline, which I love Charmaine, is the childcare crisis threatens women's workforce crisis. You cannot talk about childcare today and you cannot do the work around advocacy and also not talk about early care and education as a racial issue, a gender issue, or an economic development issue. 98% of women, of educators in this field are women, largely people of color. No one has been hit harder <laughs> um, by the lack of early care and education access than working women. 46% of people leaving the workforce are women, and they're leaving because they don't have access to early care and education. So when we talk about early care and education, we need to make sure that we are not just thinking about increasing access to seats, but we are thinking about who it is affecting when we don't have access to those seats. We are thrilled to be able to offer the programs and the services that we are going to be able to and we have already started. Um, but a big part of that is also making sure that the juice is worth the squeeze. And so there have been some lessons learned. I always tell our friends in Jefferson Parish, like, please make sure we break everything before you have to break it so that <laughs> you don't have to deal um, with so many of the challenges. But one of the things that I always hearken back to is that high quality early care and education is not cheap. Do not provide five cents of services when it costs a dollar. And so when we started our um, work in this area five years ago when we had our 50 seats and our $750,000 investment, that 2018 uh, budget with the city council, they initially wanted us to spend $4,000 a child. And it was our organization that stood up and said, absolutely not, we will not sign this contract. It's gonna be $12,000 a kid. 
And it was game changing for those six providers that got to participate. And I don't know all of you well enough, but I'm going to curse a little bit, but it was like, they gave us hell <laughs> because they said, this is three times more than it's going to cost. And you know what? Everybody's rates then went up. And so now we're in round two of that, where $12,000, which was, was the highest rate, is not now keeping up with inflation. It is no longer keeping up with the work we've been doing at the state level with the Ready Louisiana Coalition and everybody else saying, we have got to pay for the cost of care. So if you are going to swing for the fences, go for the largest rate you can, because that's what quality costs. The other thing that I would argue, um, and why that is so important, is because that is critical to your workforce shortage. The women who run our childcare providers want to pay their people as much as they can, and they cannot do it unless we invest in them. So if you want higher wages and you want a retained workforce, then the higher rates are the way to get there. And so as getting part of this millage, we all had to play different roles. I always say we had architects as part of it, designing the campaign. We had evangelists who were knocking on the doors. We had producers who were funding it and going into living rooms and you know, making, making the drum in the, drum in the banks. Um, and we had engineers who were behind the scenes saying, what happens if this gets funded and what is it going to look like? And so I would just like to say that Every person has a role. While I am standing up here talking about this millage and the work and everything that we've done, any other person who was part of that campaign could have gotten up here and talked about it from their perspective because every single person had a different role to play. The last thing I would say is that as we are thinking about this funding, you have to build the infrastructure. And so we knew that with this bamboo shoot, we were not going to be able to just drop 2,100 seats in the, in, into the city tomorrow and be able to do it, although we are. <laughs> um, but we also need to build buildings. We also need to focus on teachers. We also need to focus on getting folks into the classroom. And those things cost too. We also know that families do not come to our seats and just say, all right, well, I'm going to leave every other challenge that I have at the door. And so some of the most expensive things that we have um, invested in as part of our work have been our partnerships with Children's Hospital, which is now providing seven full-time staff, pediatricians, speech pathologists, going in and partnering with our child care centers to serve children in the early care and education classroom. So I would encourage all of us, as we are thinking about this work, to really think beyond what access means. Um, seats are really, really important, but the quality of that seat and ensuring that it truly meets the needs of families is really the highest and of, of the most paramount importance. Thank you. Well, Jen, uh, it's obvious why you have this position, and we are indeed blessed by your leadership. At this point, before um, I open it up for questions and answers, any person in this room who happens to be a high-quality early care and education provider, please rise so we can recognize and applaud your talent, your commitment, and your dedication. Hopefully you know that this program today is about you. It's about you and what you do to build resiliency in our community. And especially from our lens at United Way, I say thank you from the bottom of our hearts because you are what's going to save our Alice families, those who are asset limited, income constrained, employed oftentimes with more than one job. You're heroes to those families and we applaud you, and we are immensely grateful to you. Now, does anybody in the audience have a question they'd like to? OK, please. OK, thank you. Good morning, everybody. 
Um, I have a comment and a question. First of all, as a provider, I'd definitely like to shout out and thank Agenda for all their support that they have given us over the years. I happen to be a board member and a provider, so I see it from both sides, and without them, we would not have all the progress. So thank you, Jen, and your team. My next question is for Mr. Walker. Um, you have a community here of people who are committed to working with you to help expand and sustain parish funding for early care and education in Jefferson Parish. Are you willing to help ensure that there's dedicated funding for it like we did in New Orleans? I know you touched upon it a little bit, but I wanted to know if you could expand on that. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That's what we want. He said a big fat yes? What's that? You said yes? Yes, yes, Thank yes, you. yes, yes, Thank yes. You. Hi everybody, I'm Christy Givens with Kids of Excellence and for Providers by Providers. I just want to give a shout out to uh, Agenda for Children because I know we drive Jen crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I will text Jen six, seven o'clock in the morning. Like if I feel like something ain't right, she know and she will text me right back or she'll pick up the phone and call me. You know, but I really could say they got it right. The things that they're doing, the support they're giving us, expanding seats to our child care center, opening it up to other child care centers at the rate that it needs to be for us to hire quality staff and help us with our retention. So all these, I was on the steering committee for what, eight years, you know, and I've, Jen know, Dr. Rickasson know, Krista tell it straight, she don't get keep, she don't do no corners, she just let you know how it is, that's me. But I do this every day for all child care centers. It's not just for me. And me and Rochelle for so long, and Sonia, advocating we're not just thinking about our child care centers, we're thinking about all of the child care centers. So I just want to thank them, and I'm loving what you're doing in Jefferson Parish, and saying you also going to support New Orleans. Okay, I'm going to commit you to that. If not, I'm going to have to give you a call. Okay? <laughs> so thank everybody. Get let ready, me, Scott. Let me affirm my... She's not exaggerating. <laughs> 6 a.m. Just be ready. <laughs> and let me affirm my previous answer where I just said yes, yes, yes. To, to reaffirm that, as long as I'm here, it is one of my top priorities. I mean, we have, we have some other big issues in Jefferson Parish, like insurance problems and different things going on, but early childhood care and education will always be a top priority for me as long as I'm here. Yay. Hi, good morning. I have a question for Sorintha. Uh, the most interesting thing I've heard today yeah, yeah. is the work that you're doing with a bilingual workforce. Um, I think it's a very powerful message. You're showing that ch these children are valued and that these are families that are welcome in Jefferson Parish. I'm curious about the timing. Um, I can see that the grant was done in 2022. How long is the pilot for and when can we look forward to hearing you know, what you've learned from the pilot? Thank you. I love talking about this particular initiative. It's really a passion of mine. We are just wrapping up year one of our pilot where we've had um, 10 um, predominantly Spanish-speaking women in um, apprenticed uh, seats or in, in the apprentice program where they are supported by a bilingual mentor teacher at um, the child care site. Right now we have five centers in Jefferson Parish participating, and we've been excited to work with the Jefferson Workforce Commission, also an entity under the Jefferson Parish government, and being able to access the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act dollars to help pay for part of their salary. So it's an incredible program where we're trying to put in place wraparound supports, because we really have to figure out how to meet the needs of Latino families in Jefferson Parish, and we know that it's an area that we've not um, focused, that we've not put our attention or our dollars, and we have a long way to go. This is a very small pilot, but we're wrapping up year one where women have finished 960 hours of training and support, and they're being offered positions within those centers um, and at 
um, a, a nice hourly rate for an individual that hasn't yet earned other credentials. So we're looking to that. How do we then have a child development associate program in Spanish? Um, you know, how do we actually support them to continue moving forward? And we are about to launch um, a year or two, hopefully no later than January, and we'll continue to try to figure out how to get information out there. And it is something as we talk across Orleans that this is a regional issue. Jen and I have talked about it. We are looking um, to other organizations that work across Orleans and Jefferson to figure out how to do this regionally because it's a regional issue, not a parish issue. I want to just compliment everyone today. I think the whole language that everyone is using is completely different than when it started. I mean, Success by Six, when it started, it was a women's issue. Other than the fact it talked about women's workforce is the most affected, I didn't hear that today. It's a family issue. It's a workforce issue. The way it's being presented is totally different. I think it's an amazing growth, and I just want to say I, I think it resonates so much better than saying it's a it's not a women's issue. I have a husband. I have other kids. I work in the workforce. The men work in the workforce. The CEOs. It is such a workforce issue that's bigger than just a woman's issue. You've gone so far. It's fabulous. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Hello, I'm Rabbi Yassi Chesney. I am an administrator at Slater Torah Academy in Metairie, and I serve on the at, um, state's Early Childhood Advisory Council. Um, this is a question that's addressed both to this panel and the previous panel. Um, I've started the journey of getting involved in advocacy over the last five or so years, and it's due to the fact that Sorintha, Paula, and others have been very generous and allowing me to be politely persistent, as the word we used before. <laughs> so the question is, um, how do we engage or at, at engage our thousand plus statewide early childhood centers to be advocacy outreach points? Because it's the best way I can see how we're going to get um, political pressure put on our elected officials is if we have a real grassroots campaign, which is through having all thousand plus um, centers throughout the state being points, and that's through having them engaged and willing to engage their parents and their families and their alum in order to go to the next level. So that's really a, something I think we have to um, envision how, and I know we started putting it together during the fight for seats, which happened, but it's something that we should hopefully have in place and be able to activate and not end an emergency. So that was my question, guess, question statement. Jen, do you want to talk about four providers? That's exactly. Providers? I, well, I was gonna. I'm gonna just turn it. Um, so, there are always affinity groups. There are always membership associations. Those are always options. But what I can speak to, because you you specifically mentioned, how do providers also mobilize their families, and that is unique. And so, what our providers did during our millage campaign directly correlated with its success. They not only showed up and advocated, right? So I had one of those providers with me at every media briefing, at every council meeting, at every back, you know, at, at, with every single meeting. Truly, there was a provider, but it was their work knocking on doors and knocking on doors with their families that mobilized. And I think more than anything, they can speak to that experience of how they've been able to successfully do that. So I strongly encourage the, you know, raise your hand, Christy and Rochelle with four providers by providers because they have both done the work and can speak to it, I think, the most effectively, at least the work happening in Orleans Parish. We know everybody loves food. So we decided to do a push. We did like six child care centers, some on the West Bank, uptown, in downtown. We, we got a catering company to provide us food with food. So we got all our parents mobilized and say, hey, if you go early voting, you could come to the center with your sticker and come get a plate of food. And these parents came in droves. They came with their family. Like some people came with six people, everybody had the sticker on. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. 
And I went out and knock on doors with my staff, with my parents. And it was just amazing work that they were doing. They were talking, we were smiling, and people, some people sometimes shut the door in our face, and we knocked again, and they like, what do y'all want? But before everybody we left from, we put signs in the uh, yard, we talked to them, they was like, you know what, I'm gonna go and vote. You know, so we really did a lot of mobilizing. We got other child care centers doing mobilizing, and some of them child care centers are here today. Pamela Marshall, Pearlie Harris, Sonia, Ashley, you know, a lot of these ladies and more who are not here today did a lot of that work. So we were excited. We had a phone bank at Rochelle Center, then we had a phone bank at my center, and just standing and listening to my teachers or her teachers explain everything to people who did not have no understanding. So we really feel blessed, and we just got honored this past weekend at Four Seasons from F SFP Foundation from our great work in getting the millage pass. Well, I want to just congratulate you on that because I think in the efforts that you have just described, at my core, I understand that we have a fundamental responsibility to let every citizen understand that they have power in this great democracy, but only if we inspire them and we allow them to believe that their voice matters. So often when we're doing our community conversations, what breaks my heart is that a lot of people that we talk to don't think their opinions matter. So, you know, it reinforces what you heard Libby say. It reinforces what you've heard presented today. Engaging individuals, enlightening them, helping them to be comfortable, but for them to understand that elected leaders work for you. We have got to be part of educating them, informing them, and doing the business of, because I have to tell you, in the 40 years I've been doing this stuff, I have to tell you that elected leaders, without difference in party, if you go and you talk to them and you meet with them, they will listen and you are likely to get a champion you never dreamed would be in your court. So I applaud the work that you're doing, but I would tell each and every one of us here today, emulate that do it talk but inspire an individual to make them believe that what you know and what you care about can make a profound difference in the lives of, of the people living in your community it's changing the world that's what changes the world so congratulations on that note um we talked earlier about the next governor and the presumptive favorite is Jeff Landry. He'll probably be our next governor. Whoever is will need to be in the ear of that person to be an advocate for early childhood education. I had a conversation with Jeff Landry a couple of months ago, and I said, no matter what side you're on, Republican, Democrat, no matter what you say about John Bell Edwards, he's been a, a tremendous advocate for early childhood education. And I looked at Jeff Landry in the eyes and I said, I hope that you will be an advocate for early childhood education as well. We've done a lot in Jefferson Parish. And he stopped me and said, and this is in, a, in the middle of a room with a bunch of other people that he's trying to meet and greet. He stopped me and said, tell me about what you're doing in Jefferson Parish. So he could have easily blown it off. He could have easily said, yeah, 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 moved on to the next person. But that to me showed that he would listen. And I've talked to Stephen Wagesback and John Schroeder as well um, about the same thing. They've all indicated a desire to be a strong advocate for early childhood education. But the fact that Jeff Landry said, tell me about what you're doing in Jefferson Parish, I think that is going to be taken seriously. So we all need to tell Jeff Landry, whoever the next governor is, what we're doing in Jefferson Parish, what we're doing in Orleans Parish, and make sure that we're visible and vocal and in their ear all the time, politely persistent, as much as we can be, to make sure that next governor does at least what John Bell Edwards has done, and maybe even more. Yes. Thank you all. Well, I thank you very much. We'll now call our next panel. This will be our closing panel. But I have to tell you that I hope you recognize at this point that we were pretty intentional in the way we devised this agenda. We wanted to set the stage 
We wanted to inspire you with the subject matter experts that do this work and live this work every day at, this, at the local, state, and federal level. But we also wanted to bring the success stories of what's happening at the local municipal level. And today we close because these individuals, it is our intention to give you the perspective of we cannot forget the role that the federal government um, and uh, at the national level must be played in advocating for increased investment in high quality early care and education. I'm delighted to welcome my very dear friend, uh, Dimitrik Merkadel, who is um, the uh, director here locally for Congressman Troy Carter. I know that Troy is so upset that he can't be here today, but I think we can all appreciate and understand why his duties compel him to be in Washington, D.C., but I could tell you, Dimitri, we're overwhelmed by the fact that you could join us today uh, on such short notice with such a hectic schedule that I know you keep. So thank you. I'm also extremely honored and privileged to present to you Kathy McRae, who chairs Women United Global Leadership Council. And I have to say on the record right now that so much of the work that we are able to do in policy and advocacy, we are able to do because of the financial support we get from Women United at Southeast Louisiana. I'm also honored to present to you my colleague, my friend, a mentor in their early education space, the one and only Todd Batiste, Senior Vice President for Education and Youth Initiatives with the United Way of Southeast Louisiana. Please welcome our panelists, and we'll start with you, Dimitri. Good morning. Are we? Yeah, we're still morning. Um, so yes, my name is Dimitri Markadell. I serve as the District Director for Louisiana's 2nd Congressional District. Our territory covers from New Orleans to Baton Rouge along the river parishes. One comment you always hear the Congressman state, um, as he continued the hard work he does to bring the funds to Louisiana's 2nd Congressional District, it is important to keep people over politics. You cannot, you cannot serve to help the children, the families, if you are concerned strictly about the politics. It's very important that you do advocate on behalf of people. And funding, um, just last week, last Friday, um, to be exact. We were at the Juvenile Justice Center where the congressman was able to secure $750,000 to bring programs to work with the individuals, those individuals that are incarcerated and that have um, to be able to bring programs that they don't go back into the system. They find ways to educate them, to give them an understanding, and to, most important, another, well, I won't say another, what his primary work is, mental health. He is looking for ways to assure that these kids get the mental health help they need to be able to make the right decisions. Um, you often hear him talk about, do not be afraid to ask children if they're okay. Don't be afraid. Ask the tough questions, and especially um, the males. You know, males are very tough kids, and they want to have that demeanor in the sense that they are tough but you don't know what mental issues that they're holding. When you see them, talk to them. When you engage with them, make them feel encouraged. Make them feel like you care. You know, there's the, in the entire 
infrastructure bill, the $1.4 billion that came to our area, there's a tremendous amount of funds that's in there that will address many of the conversations that you guys have heard in the first three panels. There are, there are programs to work with individuals, to work with families, to find ways. And I won't just say for mothers to have jobs, because nowadays you're living in families where the father may be the caregiver or he may be the single parent in a home raising kids, having to make those very adjustments you said, life decisions on whether or not they could have a specific job because they have to be home at a certain time. Um, there, there is many, many opportunities that are becoming available, and the congressman will continue to work hard to bring those dollars to this area and to assure that we as individuals are forever taken care of. You know, as, as was just mentioned, elections have consequences. So the outcome of the first thing that's needed is to encourage everyone to vote, not to tell them who to vote for. Please go vote. It's embarrassing, Louisiana, as tough as we are to have 14% of the vote, 12% of the, the um, individuals that can vote showing up. We need big numbers. And, we, and I'm not gonna say 20, I'm gonna say we need the 75% vote. And uh, we have a very challenging situation this weekend alone. You've got Southern's homecoming, Grambling's homecoming and LSU playing and the Saints playing in Atlanta. That's heartening and very fearful of what can, of what can come from those results. So do please, you know, um, I didn't see what the numbers, I just saw a glimpse that said that our numbers were low for early voting, but do your best, get everyone out as it has consequences. There, are, there is some issues that much of the dollars that came through, infra, through the infrastructure bills, there were many bills that the congressman was sitting on that he was prepared for this congressional session, but those dollars were taken away by the leaders, the, the, the organization, <laughs> I don't want to get into the Republicans and Democrats, but some of the programs that we expected to fund, it was scratched out of the rules, per se, that we won't be able to fund it. But the Congressman is hopeful that we will be able, in the following year, be able to come back and support many additional programs and more ideas. It is important, our offices, we have five offices in Louisiana. We have one on Southern's campus, one on the um, River Parish campus in Reserve. We have an office on Suno's campus. We have one in Algiers, the Gretna Courthouse, and we have our flagship. Reach out to us, call us, write us, come see us, bring us your ideas, tell us what you need. We're there for you, and we definitely want to serve you. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> Kathy? Is it? Okay, can you all hear me? Hi, it's great to be here. So my name is Kathy McRae, and I'm currently the uh, chairperson of Women United Global Leadership Council. So Women United Global Leadership Council is a group of women volunteers along with their United Way, United Way staff person um, from around, right now we're in the Americas, we hope to be global, but we're trying to figure all that out, um, to connect Women United organizations to, um, to make the issues that matter to us to amplify, that's the word I was looking for, to amplify our issues. So our mission is to promote gender equity. 
And our signature issue, so this is the first year of my two-year term, and I was vice chair for the last two years. And our signature issue that we adopted and that uh, during the last uh, chairmanship and that we're carrying forward is quality care and early education. So clearly, <laughs> clearly that is near and dear to my heart and clearly um, the work that I've done here uh, as a volunteer with our Women United of Southeast Louisiana, I had the privilege to serve on chair um, on the board of trustees of uh, United Way SELA's board and um, past board chair, quality care and education is near and dear to my heart. You've heard all the experts. You know, at first I was listening to everybody and I felt like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm just, there's so many experts in this room. But then Jen gave me the right word, I'm an evangelist. So that's where I can use, that's where I can use my voice. And I'm also, so let's back up with my, um, resume, if I just looked at a black and white resume. My black and white resume was I had a 33-year career at Shell Oil. Uh, I graduated with an engineering degree. I was a development geologist and I retired as a vice president here in our deep water organization. I have had, um, I've been in charge of multi-billion dollar projects. I have looked at data that has, oh, maybe a 30 to 40 percent opportunity of coming true and made decisions on that. So when I look at childcare and I look at everything that everyone in this room has talked about, from investing a dollar now saves nine dollars or more later, about how it's not just a workforce issue, it's an economic issue. I mean, of course it's the right thing to do, but any other, any issue that you name, you can trace it back that if you invest in quality early care and education, you can tackle those issues. So now if you don't look at my resume and what's behind the resume, what's behind my resume is I was the first person in my family to go to college. I was raised by a single mother and shout out to all you um, early care and educators that are in this room. I was in the first cohort of Head Start. So I am that bamboo shoot some <clears throat> 50 some years later because somebody took the time and somebody funded a seat, and somebody nurtured me. I've had an amazing career around the world because of people and because of advocates like are in this room. So now it's my turn to say, okay, let's take what we have done here in Louisiana and let's scale it up and take it to the federal level. Let's make sure we can get the work that's done so people don't have to build it like everyone's built it here. I mean, I moved to Louis New Orleans in 96, and I had a two-year-old and a four-year-old. And we were two engineers on a good salary, and we had a hard time. So Patty went over the, the history of education. We had a hard time finding childcare on a good salary. And I looked around at this beautiful city based on hospitality, and music and the arts, and I said, how do people do it? And so that's how I actually got involved with Success by Six and Women United. And because it just makes so much sense. So now, I hope you all will, will take my calls because we're gonna be having several events coming up with our Women United Global Leadership Council that I would love to have your stories so we can move our work and take it to the federal level. We're having, there's the ALICE Summit that um, United Way is doing at the um, end of July, end of January of 2024, but we're convening our Women United Global Leadership Council um, in conjunction with that. And so I would love to tap into the knowledge and resource there so we can figure out how can we spread it across our network and move it. Then we're also having Advocacy Day um, and Policy Day in July of 2024. Again, push on quality um, early childcare and education. And then we're having, we haven't had one, gosh, probably in seven years, I'm looking out there, I think, of, of we're, we're actually convening a Women United Worldwide Summit in October of 2024. 
And from there, it'll be a platform to how we push our mission of making sure that not only here in Louisiana, but that every child in the United States has the opportunity to be the best person they can be and that they get off to the most brilliant start they can. And so I'm looking just to make sure because my mind is going in a million <laughs> directions. There's so many exciting things in this venue, but um, you know, so, so I think about my career and we think about things take a long time. You need research, you need input, you need measuring the outcomes, and then you need to complete the cycle. It's such a whole cycle and it's so heartening to be in this room to see from the beginnings to where we are now, not that we don't have a long way to go, but to take a moment to see where we were and where we are now and the excitement and where we can move in the future and how we can take our learnings and spread it across this nation and make sure that everybody gets involved because we need, we need our children to, I mean, we had the song this morning, our children are our future, right? So whether the voter is a childless couple, they need to vote for quality early care and education because their communities are impacted if it's not available. Whether it's somebody beyond, their children are grown. Who's going to do the trades to help up keep their neighborhood? Who's going to be the next doctors? Who's going to be it all, 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 and I know I'm preaching to the choir, goes back to quality early care and education. So I hope that I can tap into your all great resources on these upcoming events the next year and that we can take what we've done here and move it out to the federal level. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Kathy, for your uh, unwavering commitment to the work that we are doing in policy and advocacy at the United Way um, at all levels of government, but for your time, for your talent, and for your treasure, you are a blessing to us, and we are so appreciative that you were able to be here today and to participate in our program. You're a shining light. Thank you. Okay, Todd, take it away. Thank you, Charmaine. Todd Batiste, I serve as Senior Vice President for Education with United Way for Southeast Louisiana, and it feels good to be back home. I was <laughs> away from United Way for a while, but I consider myself to be like Simba from The Lion King. I went off, I did all kinds of things, and hopefully I was able to bring something back to United Way that will help to continue to move this agenda forward. Uh, one of the things my colleagues that know me know I always use what I call the three Bs, to be brilliant, to be brief and to be gone. Because nobody <laughs> wants you standing up there talking all evening. But I get the privilege of working with Shermaine at the state, city, state, and federal level on policy and advocacy issues as it relates to early childhood education. And I'm excited about the conversation today because as I was thinking and preparing, there were so many thoughts going through my head about the experiences that I've had with United Way and our policy and advocacy work. I was fortunate to be the staff person for that initiative that folks keep talking about success by six. That <laughs> and success by six sort of gave me my entree into early childhood advocacy. And as I was thinking about that, the Women's Leadership Council back then, Women's Leadership Initiative, and now Women United, introduced me to the importance of policy and advocacy work. But in that conversation I was having with myself, there was a little bit of, I was sort of unsettled about going talk with elected officials. It's like, oh, that's just not me. I don't do that. Like, you know, I'll do the work. I can manage the program, move the initiatives forward. But one young lady told me, she said, elected officials work for you. And you can imagine who that was, who may have told me that. She said, they work for you. And in that conversation, I recall thinking that elected officials, my mayor, my city council person, my state representative, the senator, U.S. representative, and the president, they all work for me. Thinking about that and saying they work for me, that changed the conversation for me. I became a lot more comfortable. And Libby shared one of my proverbs from an African tribe when they say, how are the children? And that community responds, 
the children are well, they put and acknowledge, they put high value that they've placed on children when they ask how they're doing. Elected officials and leaders have a vision, they have an ideology, they have a message that aligns with yours or ours. The children of this city, this state, and this country are our responsibility. And based on my experience, going up to city officials, elected officials at the state level and at the federal level, they need to hear from you. And they want to hear from you. Because lots of times, they don't have the lived experiences and the information to help them make good decisions. So one of the things my mother always told me was that the squeaky wheel gets the oral. So United Way for Southeast Louisiana has been that squeaky wheel. This one young lady right here, Charmaine, has a voice, she has a passion, she has a commitment to the work, and I have the privilege and honor of serving next to her on a daily basis as we fight for the children. That's why your local United Way is in lockstep with United Way worldwide, and more than 1,000 other local United Ways around the country. We're being that community voice at the city, the state, and federal level. Those conversations that we're having in the community, we listen, we take notes, we talk with other colleagues in this room, and we develop an advocacy strategy. We are that squeaky wheel. The United Way of Southeast Louisiana is rooted in advancing racial and economic equity and opportunity. With United Way Worldwide, encouraging cross-sector collaboration and problem solving promoting civic engagement and democracy, and growing our potential impact. United Way Worldwide and United Way Worldwide Networks advocate for priorities to advance the common good in communities across the country. At the national level, United Way Worldwide establishes the priorities and provides a blueprint for local United Ways on policy work at the national, state, and local level. That we can utilize it. We utilize it here. Other United Ways across the country utilize it. And when we have that kind of investment and voice going up to Washington, it's more than just Louisiana. Some of our partners from uh, neighboring states, Alabama, Texas, Mississippi, are delivering a similar message. Their advocacy and their needs might be different, but when elected officials hear from across the country that there's a lot of folks coming up here from different states talking about the importance of early childhood education, we get that kind of movement. They set the policy and advocacy goals for us. It allows opportunities for us to engage with elected officials at the federal level and the state level, and locally some administrative officials. It provides context for state and local policy agendas. It builds on communities and corporate partnerships. We were fortunate. We have one of the only Fortune 5 companies here Patty Riddleberger with Entergy, who has made significant investments in early childhood education, and we have rolled that wave, and we appreciate that. United Way Worldwide also offers a broader strategy for policy initiatives. We have a campaign called the Campaign for Great Level Reading that looked at beyond what happens in early childhood education. Once we build that system, there needs to be a system in place to accept the kids so that they continue to grow. So we're working in our public school system to prepare all kids to be reading on level by the time they get to third grade. And for United Way, it also expands our community impact work with our resource development partners, our campaign, and delivering marketing messages. My instructions were to give a brief overview, <laughs> and I look forward to the discussion from other audience, from the audience and the panel. But I have the privilege and honor of working with Shermaine on a daily basis. So my learning curve has just took off exponentially. <laughs> she has taken me to places where I never thought I would go. And I hope I continue to be a strong advocate for the young folks in this community so that one day we can say, how are the children? And we can all respond, the children are well. Thank you. Well, thank you, Todd, and I'm humbled, humbled by your kind remarks. Um, I think it's fair to say that I wake up every single day of my life with gratitude, a heart filled with gratitude, because how on earth could I have been given 
the incredible privilege to work for an organization that I know is really committed to doing what's absolutely necessary to empower our entire community to be healthy, to be able to find the resources they need to live a little piece of the American dream. For us to inspire individuals to believe that education, it's not a gift given you because of your zip code, but that every single person is entitled to the high quality education standards that allow them to fully achieve the gifts and the blessings that they received from their creator. We can't just automatically know. I would have never dreamed in my life had a community not loved me, had I not been surrounded by educators my whole life that pushed me to dream that I could one day be where I am today, working for this phenomenal international organization and meeting the most beautiful people from every sector of life. I have to tell you, to my collaborative partners, who join United Way unselfishly because you want to collaborate, because you believe that when we work together, as Libby said, we want to go far. We want to all be far, but we want to all hold hands and achieve that great success together because we all have a personal commitment to the work that we are doing. I'm so sorry that my president and CEO, Michael Williamson, couldn't be with us today because the work that we are able to do at United Way, whether it's policy and advocacy, community impact, diversity, equity, and inclusion, all aspects of the work that we, that we do takes a courageous and devoted and dedicated president and CEO. That president and CEO has an incredible responsibility to assemble a board of trustees that shares our vision, that shares our passion, and that automatically infuses us with the energy and the passion necessary to achieve the dream. For that, I am eternally grateful because being the head of an organization is not easy. For those of you who have that title, you know the commitment that it takes. So I acknowledge and recognize the extraordinary leadership that Michael Williamson offers us, but I applaud the courageous commitment by our Board of Trustees. And I don't say that lightly. We have 12 United Ways that operate throughout the great state of Louisiana, but I want you to know that we are the single United Way in Louisiana that has had the courage to hire an advocate to do the work of policy and advocacy, and I am, yes, a registered lobbyist. I want you to know that it can make you feel squeamish because you worry that politics can often get, and it can threaten your ability to raise funds, or it could threaten the misunderstanding of communities to understand, ooh, I'm scared. We're not scared of policy and advocacy. Let me tell you why. For every single dollar, for every single commitment being made by volunteers that care about the work that we are doing, for every dollar we invest back in this community, we could fundraise 24-7 every day of the week and never raise enough money to meet the growing demand for services. There are things that only your government can do and they have a fundamental moral obligation to step up and do it. So we must educate them, we must inspire them, we must enlighten them, and we must not only talk the talk, but walk the walk. I couldn't be more proud of the financial resources on a very limited budget that our United Way is making in early care and education. We are hiring the top professional staff to lead that work, and we are investing with our partners. For that, this community in this state is richly blessed. But I ask you all to stand up right now. 
I want you to take your hand and I want you to reach over and pat yourself on the back. Because believe you me, we can have all the passion and all the commitment and be willing to do all the work. Nothing is possible without we the people. You the people. You the people make this great democracy work. You care about early care and education? Let's go tell the feds what they have a responsibility to do, and that is to return those child tax credits because anything that puts half of our children back in poverty is unacceptable. Let's go tell the federal government that you have a moral obligation to fund these centers delivering high quality and helping us fight to make sure they receive the financial resources they need to grow a pipeline of highly educated, trained executives in those centers. Let's go tell whoever the next governor or elected leader is, that investing in early care and education is a shared responsibility. If you are running for elective office in a parish, you need to be funding high quality early care and education. If you are looking to be a, a public servant at the state level, look around this room, because you're gonna get to know us personally. We insist you meet the level of investment we know will provide all children equal access to high quality early care and education. God bless you for coming here. We love you.